And my name is Randy Hampton. I'm a public information officer for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So I'm going to I'm going to turn things over to Kathleen Mawinney. And Kathleen is our education coordinator for the Northwest region. So Kathleen, I'll let you unmute and um, take it away. Thanks, Randy. Um, as Randy said, my name is Kathleen Mooney. I am the Northwest Education and Hunter Outreach Coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And um, it is the new way to kind of do our one-on-ones. We work with a couple partners for tonight. And so we're excited about that. So instead of just hearing from me, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves and we're going to learn a little um, about who everybody is and um, why they're interested in offering this. And then hopefully next year we can do it in person. So I am Kathleen, I'm with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Northwest Region Hunter Outreach and Education Coordinator. Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Brian Postumas. I am the statewide Hunter Outreach Coordinator and uh, the Hunter Outreach Program does a lot of different types of outreach. I just wanna put a plug in. If you're interested in, in learning more about what Colorado Parks and Wildlife does with Hunter Outreach, go to our Colorado Parks and Wildlife website and just in the search bar, type in Hunter Outreach and you, you ought to be able to get into the page and explore it from there. Thank you. How about Kirsten? Hi guys, my name's Kirsten Miller. I'm a park ranger with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and I work up at Steamboat Lake. Um, I am part of the panel tonight because I check a lot of waterfowl hunters. So. Um, I've done a small amount of waterfowl hunting, not an expert by any means, but I do check a lot of waterfowl hunters. So that's kind of my lead in here. And I'll have, um, oh, I was, gonna, I was gonna have Justin go and I'll start sharing my screen. Um, and then uh, Atlanta and Jamie can follow. Thanks. Um, my name is Justin Cross. I'm a uh, regional director for uh, backcountry hunters and anglers up here in northeast Colorado, but uh, we mainly do most of our work around Fort Collins and try and branch out to the eastern part of the state. Um, and I'm a very avid duck hunter, not an expert. I don't think it's something you ever become an expert at, but uh, if there was one thing, if I was going to go on one hunt, uh, you know, only got one hunt ever again, it'd be a, it'd be a duck hunt. So I uh, want to share some of the things I've learned from hunting public land uh, for ducks in Colorado over the last, I don't know, 18 years or so. I guess I'll start. Um, hi, I'm Elena Reynolds. I am the founder of Rocky Mountain Sportswoman, and I got my co cohort Jamie here with me as well. Um, yeah, we are uh, based out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado, just a group of women who are just trying to get uh, more women together and learning how to hunt and fish. I am an adult onset hunter and um, just wanted to learn alongside other women and waterfowl hunting has been a huge thing in my mind and I've never gone. I don't know anything about waterfowl hunting so I kind of poked some, poked some people to help us put this together. So I'm super excited to learn with everybody and um, just kind of share the community. Jamie, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Jamie. I'm the co-founder of Rocky Mountain Sportswoman. Um, I came from Northern New York and so I did a lot of duck hunting and goose hunting there. Um, what I love about Rocky Mountain Sportswoman is we're working to create a network of women who are passionate about the outdoors and interested in doing things together. So um, I'm really excited to learn about the differences with birds that migrate through Colorado and kind of go out with some, some women here and, and um, kind of just learn more and go have fun together. Um, so that's one thing I love about Rocky Mountain Sportswomen is we're just working to create that network of women that are willing to get out there and try new things and learn, learn new things. So. I'll let Brian start about CPW. Yeah, most of you might be familiar with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. We, uh, we manage the wildlife of Colorado. We also manage and uh, offer opportunities for outdoor recreation with our wonderful state parks all across Colorado. So odds are you've probably had interactions with someone from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, whether it's a, a park ranger or a wildlife officer, district wildlife manager is, is another word for them. 
So our, our mission uh, is to perpetuate the wildlife resources of the state, to provide a quality state park system. I, I think we do that. And to provide enjoyable, sustainable outdoor recreation opportunities that educate and inspire current and future generations to serve as active stewards of Colorado's natural resources. That's a mouthful, everyone. I know it's a mouthful, but what we're all passionate about here at the state and even our partners that we work with, it, it's providing outdoor recreation, quality outdoor recreation, not only for people today, but into the future. And part of that outdoor recreation is hunting and fishing. And, and the folks that we're partnering with today are, are going the extra mile to get other people out there hunting or fishing or getting them outdoors. And uh, it's a lot of what um, we are passionate about, but it's also important because the funding comes from the people that use um, the state parks. The people that use state parks fund the state parks. The wildlife management is coming primarily from hunting and fishing licenses. Um, that, that's the, the bulk of it. There's some other um, money that we get as well that comes from um, these, these federal excise taxes that, that when you buy um, firearms, ammunition, when you buy hunting, fishing gear, a lot, any of that, that stuff, there's a tax that's on that that goes to the federal government. The government divvies that back out to the states based on several different factors. So that's a big part of the money that we get as well. And then if you play any of the Colorado lottery, the, the great outdoors Colorado funds a lot of our, our management as well, a lot of education, a lot of outdoor programs as well. So it's significant that when people go out hunting, fishing, when they go out into the parks, that they realize that they are the, the primary source of revenue to manage our wildlife, to manage our quality recreation across the state. If you want to take a look at our, our website, we've got a lot of information. Uh, just go to cpw.state.co.us. There's a ton of information. You could probably spend two or three weeks just pouring through all the different web pages that are in there. But it, it is set up where you uh, hopefully can, can find what you need in, in two, three, four clicks. Um, but yeah, I, I encourage you to take a look at the website, learn all about what we do and, and why we do it. We, we do it for you. So we, we work for you. So um, yeah, take a look at that the page if you haven't looked at it yet. Thanks, Brian. So tonight we're gonna have four main topics, but we're gonna do laws and regulation, some wildlife ID, and then calls, decoys, outdoor gear, and then potential setups for how you would hunt um, the different species. Um, and as Randy pointed out, make sure as we go, if we come up with um, something that's confusing or something you want a more clarification on, please use the question and answer and we'll try to either answer it to the group or type in the answer for you guys. But I'm gonna pass it over to Kirsten. Hi guys, Kirsten. Um, again, I'm a park ranger at Steamboat Lake, so I check lots of hunters all the time. Um, we're going to start off with laws and regulations, things that you need to know as a hunter before you make it out into the field. Um, this is the current 2020 uh, small game and waterfowl brochure. We'll get you guys copies sent out. You can also pick one up at any state park, any Colorado Parks and Wildlife office, and they're also available on our website. You can get a digital copy, keep it on your phone. Um, you should have lots of them. They're an awesome reference. Everything that we as officers expect you guys to know is gonna be in this little book. Um, so first things, what you need in order to purchase a license, um, that's covered on page one in your brochure. Um, in order to hunt waterfowl in the state of Colorado, you have to have some form of hunter education, um, whether that be an actual hunter education firearm certificate from another state or from Colorado, or we now have an apprentice certification that you can do um, hunt with a, another hunter that actually has hunter education. Um, but that certificate of apprenticeship is only good for a single year. So after that first year, um, you can hunt the entire year with it. You have to be with an adult that is a hunter ed qualified hunter, but you um, have to go and get your own hunter ed after that year. It's just an opportunity to give people a foot in the door if they've never hunted before. 
Um, so you got to have your hunter's ed. Um, you got to have a small game license. And then you also need a duck stamp. So you need a state Colorado duck stamp and a federal duck stamp. Um, and then you also have to have a HIP number, which um, all the information on how to get your HIP number is, I believe it's still on the back of your license. Yeah, so it's got all the information um, where you'll need to call to get your HIP number. And then you'll just need to put that on the front of your um, hunting license before you make it out into the field. Youth uh, do not have to have youth for small game is considered 16 and under. They don't have to have the waterfowl stamps. They can hunt with just their small game. But everybody 16 and older has to have a small game and both um, both of their stamps. And then all of the migratory bird stuff starts on page six um, in your brochure. Sure. And I don't know if any of you guys have these at home, but I'm like actually looking at my brochure as I go over this. Um, everything again that we expect you guys to know is going to be in these brochures. Um, all shotguns that you use to hunt waterfowl with cannot be larger than a 10 gauge shotgun and they cannot be capable of holding more than three shotgun shells and that's in the magazine and chamber combined. So if you have one in the chamber, you can only have two in the magazine and you have to be certain that your shotgun is not capable of holding more than two in the magazine. Um, you, if you have a shotgun that's maybe for more home defense purposes, a lot of times those magazines are going to be larger capacity. You can buy a, it's called a plug. You can get them at pretty much any um, outdoor sporting shop. Um, and you'll have to install that before you can go out and hunt. Um, slugs are illegal to hunt waterfowl with in the state of Colorado. Um, baiting is illegal. So if you're using any vegetation to camouflage a blind or some other spot where you're hunting, you have to make sure that that's not got grain or anything like that in it because that would be considered baiting. Um, hunting is allowed from vessels in the state of Colorado, but the motor must be off and sails must be um, down. You can't be moving at all while you're hunting waterfowl from any type of vessel. Um, there's something else. Oh, and you can use the motor when you're setting up your decoys. It's just when you're actually actively in the act of hunting, the motor has to be off. Um, there can't be any any forward movement. Um, again, baiting is illegal. Traps, snares, nets, rifles, pistols, swivel guns, battery guns, those are all illegal. Um, you cannot use live, tame, or captive ducks as decoys. Um, so if you have a private pond that you're hunting and have um, domestic geese or duck on that pond, they need to be removed from that area at least 10 days before hunting. Um, you can't leave decoys or other hunting things in the field or on the water overnight in state wildlife areas and the same applies to state parks. A lot of our state parks have opportunities for hunting, but you can't go out and set up your blind the day before. You'll have to do it in the morning prior to hunting. Um, you can't shoot across roads or highways that kind of just applies everywhere. And another big thing is you can't use electronic or recorded calls. Every call that you want to use for waterfowl hunting has to be, um, done by yourself. You can't use anything that's recorded. And then for transporting birds, this is another thing that, um, is kind of important. You need to have one fully feathered wing and the head still attached to the carcass so that we can identify that type of bird. Um, you need to make sure that any shot you're using while waterfowl hunting is non-toxic. So pretty much anything that's not lead. Our brochure has an awesome table in it of non-toxic shot lethality. Um, it basically goes through the type of shot and, um, you know, cause there's steel or tungsten, a lot of different things that are used to make these non-toxic shots. And this little table tells you a lot of great information about what those different shot types are good for. Um, and again, that's inside the brochure on page number eight. And then 
when you get further into the brochure, it'll actually break down flyaways and tell you your specific bag and possession limit for the certain types of birds. And now I know we've got people from all over the state that, um, sorry, I'm just looking at one of these questions. So it says no forward movement. Does that mean that you can't float the river and shoot from a raft? Um, that is not what I'm talking about here. It explicitly says like propulsion. So you can't have a motor activated or um, be paddling your boat. But if you're floating down the river, that's not what it's talking about. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay, I think I did that right. Um, yeah, Kathleen, if you could go to the next slide, I believe. And again, um, if anybody has any questions about the laws and regulations, I just highly recommend reading this book. Um, everything that we expect you guys to know as hunters is in here. Is that the screen you want? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, the next couple screens are just showing you guys the different flyways. Again, I understand we have people from all over theoretically in here. So um, if you look, they're all different colors. And at the bottom of the screen, it'll tell you the name of that flyway. Even within flyways, there are different zones. So for Route County, where I'm at, for example, you can go to the um, 12th page in our book and it'll tell you for each flyway what your your zone is and what your season dates and possession limits are. So for the area that I am in right now, I am in the Pacific Flyway in the eastern zone. So if you look at that map, Route County is in the eastern portion of that Pacific Flyway. And again, it'll list out the counties too, which is helpful. Um, the waterfowl duck coot and teal season runs from october 3rd through january 15th of 2021 and it'll list out all of your um daily bag limits so the difference between a daily bag limit and your possession limit is daily bag limit is the number of birds you're allowed to take in a single day um, this applies for all of our bag limits so for any small game or fishing um so you can have that many birds that day. Now say that you take them all home, you don't eat any of them and you put them in the freezer. The next day you can go back and take more birds, but in total from all of your days of hunting, you can only have what is considered your possession limit. So that's how many you're allowed to have frozen, you know, killed that day, all of that in combination. Um, so for the daily bag limit in the Eastern zone of the Pacific Flyway, which is where I'm at right now, the duck and merganser limit is seven in aggregate of these. So it, it's pretty specific and this is why um, bird ID is so important. So in aggregate means in combination of these listed things. So seven of these, no more than two can be female mallards, one pintail, two canvas back, two redhead and um, two scope, but nothing, none of them can be taken after December 27th. So again, if you had um, two female mallards, you can't shoot any more female mallards than that, but you can fill up to your seven with five male mallards. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, but that's what it's talking about in that seven in aggregate. Um, again, season dates different differ. Yeah, so you can see here um, under that Eastern zone, it lists out all of the counties for you, um, season dates, and then your uh, daily bag limit. And you'll see, um, for example, under the northeastern zone of the central flyway, they have two different splits in the season. So over here in Route County in particular, we just have one season date that runs through. Um, but 
over in the central flyway in the northeast zone they have a date that runs october 10th through november 30th and then there's a break and then the season starts up again december 19th and runs through january 31st so again it's super important to know where you're hunting um, because the dates aren't consistent across the board um all right kathleen you can go to the next slide for me That's a table. So this is just again the same example, but for geese. And you'll notice it is a little different um, than even the duck zones and flyways. Um, <clears throat> the flyways are all pretty much the same, but the zones are a little different. And again, it's just super important to know where you are. Um, again, all of the limits. Um, are listed underneath your your zones. You can go to the next one, Kathleen. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of what the brochure looks like. Um, those flyways are just important to know so that you know where you are and how many of what kinds of birds you can keep and what the season dates are. Um, waterfowl hunting is a little bit more specific than a lot of our general small game hunting um, rules and regulations. So um, a lot of safety things to be thinking about when you're waterfowl hunting. Obviously think about your environment. Um, outdoors with anything you gotta you know think about um hazards in the field tripping hazards ice if it's slick where you're hunting um and always maintain really good firearm safety handling um firearm safety rules which are the same that we go over in hunter safety is number one treat every firearm as if it's always loaded um number two never let the muzzle of a firearm point at anything you're not willing to destroy Number three, always keep your finger off the trigger and outside the trigger guard until your sights are on target and you're prepared to shoot. And number four, always know your target and beyond. A lot of the places, um, at least specifically that Colorado Parks and Wildlife allows you guys to hunt, there are other user types. So that fourth rule, I mean, they're all super important, but that fourth rule is super important to think about too. Um, we never want to be hunting waterfowl when they're flying over an area where people may be walking, for example. Um, so it's always important to establish a leader in your waterfowl hunting group whoever is in the blind they're going to be the person a lot of times that's doing the calling and they're going to be calling the shots so they'll be telling you guys okay this is your zone to shoot if a bird comes into that zone you know jamie that's your bird and as soon as the birds are where they feel are close enough they'll say okay jamie take them um just for example so it's always good to have that person that's in the group, um, taking control of everything, calling the shots. Another thing that's super big when you are hunting in a blind, especially, is um, a lot of times the birds are slow and people will lean their guns up against something in the blind. Um, not always a great idea. A lot of times they'll fall down and it's almost always inevitable that the muzzle is going to land in the mud and you're just going to have a big mess of problems. So if your your blind doesn't have something an actual rack to set firearms in, I always recommend that you just hold on to them again so they don't fall. But number two, you have a lot more control of the firearm that way. Dogs aren't going to knock them over and you can always be sure of where your muzzle is pointed. So um, firearm safety rules are huge, especially when you're in close quarters with other people. A um, lot of things to think about. So just always make sure that you're maintaining um, good firearm safety and again, know your surroundings. Um, do you want to go to the next slide for me, Kathleen? And are you guys hearing me okay? My um, internet said it was slow. Can you hear me, Kathleen? You can just nod. 
I can totally hear you. I was just going to add to your last yeah. slide that, um, especially if you're going to be on public land, don't hesitate to throw some hunter orange, in, like a vest or a hat. As you hike in and you hike out, you're not hunting. There's no worry of scaring anything, but it lets other users know that you're there and that you're present. And um, it's not bad to have. You hide, of course, while you're actually hunting the waterfowl or the geese, but hiking in and hiking out, if you're on a property that's got other types of hunters out there, especially like upland bird, then for your own safety sake, it's good to throw uh, orange in your pack. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. And with that in mind, too, we do have hunters at Steamboat Lake State Park. Um, a lot of state parks allow and offer hunting opportunities. But one thing that is really important for people to know is where they can hunt, when they can hunt, and what they can hunt. So um, I'm sure we'll touch on it a little bit later, but um, the Colorado State Recreational Land Brochure this is kind of your go-to for all of that information when it comes to state lands. Um, so uh, state wildlife areas will be listed in here, state trust lands and state parks. Um, it's listed alphabetically under the land type. And if you go in there, it'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, one thing in particular at Steamboat Lake, we've recently added a sign-in sheet um, just so we know who's out there and um, where people are at. But Again, that state recreational lands brochure, that's going to be your go to for where you can go to hunt um, as far as state lands go. So I'm going to go over a brief hunting check. Um, these are the things that I'm going to be looking for in the field when I go out to check hunters. First and foremost, I'm not trying to sneak up on anybody. I understand you guys are in blinds and a lot of times you're just looking out towards the water and you can't see me when I'm approaching from behind you. So I'm going to make my presence well known to you guys and announce a long time in advance because the last thing I want to do is startle somebody when I know that they've got a gun in their hands. So again, those firearm safety rules are really awesome for you guys to keep in mind. Um, obviously, don't turn around and point it at anybody. Keep your muzzle pointed in a safe direction. And like I said, I'll, I'll always approach um, from the land side, obviously. So uh, I'm not trying to startle anybody. Um, when I come up to check a hunter, I'm obviously going to be checking your license. Um, a lot of a thing that I've been finding is really confusing for a lot of hunters lately is hunter ed certificates. You are actually required to uh, have your hunter ed card on your person while you're hunting, unless you have been manually verified. So on your hunting license, if you look at mine, for example, down here on the very bottom, Mine says hunter education certificate, and then it says firearm and it has a little V next to it. And then it's got my hunter ed number. Um, a lot of people that have never had their hunter ed card manually verified, that means they've never taken it into a parks and wildlife office and shown it to somebody to enter it into our computer. It will say um, hunter education card required. And then it'll still have the number. So, um, a lot of people will put in for the draw and get a license and then they never have to come into our office to purchase their license. So a lot of times they're inputting their information on their side and we never see their hunter ed card. So that's why we require you to carry it in the field. Um, it's just something that uh, a lot of people, I guess, are a little bit confused about. But if you are required to carry your hunter ed card, it will tell you on your license and if you guys ever want to get verified just take your hunter ed card and um, go into any colorado parks and wildlife office and they can manually verify it for you um, you can't do it at walmart or some of the gas stations and stuff that sell licenses but you can do it at any cpw location um, so i'm going to check your license i'm going to check for your hunter ed card whether you have that or you've got it verified i'm going to look for your small game license and then both of your waterfowl stamps and I'm going to be checking for your HIP number. Um, after I've checked your license, I'll, I'll usually make a note of who you are just so I know, you know, so and so always hunts over here. It's just kind of good information for us to have. After that, I'm going to check your shotgun capacity. Um, I tend to have hunters manipulate their firearms um, just so I'm not touching your stuff. And um, again, we're out in the elements, but a lot of times this is. Um, a thing that new hunters have a, a really hard time with. And um, I see a lot of people hand their gun to someone else uh, because they don't know how to do it. Um, 
So I'm, I do have my shotgun here. Um, and I'll show you guys exactly what I'm talking about with uh, checking the capacity on your shotgun. So this is just a Remington 870. Um, it is in a 20 gauge, it's not a 12 gauge, but I'm gonna shut the action on my firearm. And this portion right here is the magazine. Um, just like a magazine for a pistol, it is where extra rounds are stored when they're not in the chamber. So again, um, you can only have three in your gun, two in the magazine, and that's counting one in the chamber. So three total. What I'm gonna have you do is download your firearm so that it is completely empty. And then I'm gonna have you try and insert three rounds into the firearm. So one, two, and then the third one should not go all the way in. So if you guys can see, that one doesn't want to go all the way into my gun, um, and it won't. That's because this, um, this magazine has a plug in it. So this cap comes off and there is a spring under tension. So after you get that cap off, you can carefully open that and remove it and you'll have a plug in there. <laughs> if for some reason you don't have a plug, like I said, you can get them at most um, outdoor retailers and uh, you just need to make sure that the shotgun is not capable of holding more than two in the magazine when you go hunting. Um, a lot of times new hunters borrow stuff from friends. Again, just make sure that if you're hunting with someone else's gun, you know how it works and that it cannot hold more than two rounds. Um, it's your responsibility as a hunter, even though it's not your gun. So to unload it, this is the um, action release and hopefully you guys can kind of see that. It's just a little button that'll allow the forearm to move and it will, oh, we're switching views here. I was trying to make your screen bigger, sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. I was gonna say, I, I can't tell it's still on you. You're doing great, Kirsten. You keep going. We'll be good. Can you see me? I can't tell. It just says wildlife now. Okay. So anyways, every time um, you want to move the forearm and manipulate the action and you haven't shot, you have to push that release button. And again, it'll just bring them out into the um, opening of your action there. One thing that a lot of hunters seem to have a hard time with is when they download their gun, um, fighting the urge to like reach out and grab those shells. So that's safer to let them just fall on the ground than bending over with your gun because then we're covering people and all sorts of stuff. Um, so just be very mindful of your firearm safety when you're um, downloading your gun or in a hunter check with any of our officers. Um, and again, I prefer to have hunters um, show me their weapons as opposed to doing that portion for them. Um, okay, we can go back to the slideshow. That was the only thing I wanted to show was um, downloading because a, a lot of times I get out in the field and people don't know how to unload their shotgun or what I mean when I'm asking them to check the magazine for me. So, and I'm just gonna interject that I totally appreciate that you just showed everyone that. Um, in hunter outreach, we see a lot that um, parents don't trust their kiddos with their license or parents actually don't give their kids the benefit of the doubt that they can handle everything that the shotgun can do. When in reality, if we're going to give someone on a hunter education card and we're going to give them a license, then you should be confident that they are completely safe with their shotgun and able to understand it and use it. So um, Thank you for showing everybody that because that is a big deal we run into in hunter outreach. The parent will try to do it for the kiddo or a significant other will try to do it for their spouse. And in reality, when you get your hunter ed, it's kind of rewarding to be able to carry your license on yourself. And it's definitely rewarding to own your own shotgun and be able to use it properly. So thank you. Yeah, you bet. Like I said, I see it all the time in the field. I just want you guys to all be comfortable and 
Um, I think it's a, a lot of times the apprentice type situation and sometimes people are borrowing firearms from a, from a friend to go hunting, which is totally fine. Just um, be confident. Um, the next thing that I'm going to check um, is your shot type. And a lot of times I kind of do this at the same time that you're um, downloading for me. Um, but I'm just going to make sure that it says somewhere that it is not a lead um, round. Um, and then if you have any birds, I'm going to check the birds that you have. A lot of times people are in big groups. So, you know, you've got all of your birds um, sitting together. I'll oftentimes ask, you know, okay, who got what and have um, the hunters in the group kind of spread out their own birds. That way um, I can at least, you know, say, okay, so you have only two hens of um, mallards, so you're good and you have one hen. So basically I'm just trying to keep count of who has what. And again, if you guys wanna dress them in the field, just make sure that you have a fully feathered wing and the head attached. Um, Personally, this is one of my favorite parts of my job. I love getting out in the field. I love talking to hunters. It's a great opportunity um, for me to find out, you know, how things have been for everybody out in the field, if people are doing good, if they're seeing birds. Um, but it's also a good opportunity for all of you guys. Um, we're a resource and like everybody said at the beginning, we are here to serve you guys. Um, that's why I do what I do. I love um, connecting with people. I love the outdoors and I really like connecting people to meaningful outdoor experiences. And so anything that we can do to help you out or give you information, don't hesitate to ask because we're full of information. We're talking to people all the time. So it's an awesome opportunity for all of us. And does anybody have any questions about any of that? Cool. Thank you for that. We are going to move to, um, well, well, if I can get the screen to go. We're going to move to duck identification, which is directly correlated with bag limits. And it's super important when you're duck hunting to actually work on your duck identification, especially depending on your area where there's limits to just one of a female species or um, even the male species. But um, it's important to know when you're first learning um, ducks, it can be pretty daunting to identify each individual one, but by spending time with your binoculars, an identification book, and just watching ducks out like on a lake or a body of water, you can learn a lot about what you'll be hunting. Um, each of the species are super unique with their size, their shape, their plumage, um, their wing beat, um, actually, like how they fly, how fast they flap their wings, their behavior. Do they like to be solitary? Do they like to be in groups? Are they diving? Are they dabbling? You can learn a lot of those things just by observing who's out there. But a good pair of binoculars is going to be super helpful when you're doing this part. Um, I will say... Um, we just heard about laws and regs and a lot of people get overwhelmed and super um, nervous about that. But in reality, the better, the more open relationship you have with our officers, the better. Um, I myself, I'm not an officer, I'm just an educator, but our um, field crew are out there all the time. Our officers are out there checking. They don't want to write you a ticket. They want to actually get a relationship with you and enjoy why you're there. So make sure that you reach out and you talk to them every chance you get, and um, you'll learn a tremendous amount while you're out there. But um, spend lots of hours really watching these birds before you try to go hunt. And then um, when you're hunting, try to find somebody who has a passion about it. While I actually talk about the species, um, a few species of Colorado, Justin with um, backcountry uh anglers and hunting and anglers is actually hopefully can he can chime in if he's got any calls that he's good at that is definitely not my forte but um just be aware that we do have some species out there that are rare that are not included in something you can hunt but we also have some species that we don't mention so they'll just be a part of your bag limit and not specifically just one here and one there so there will be species out there that aren't always present, but potentially are, and um, sometimes rare in an area. But I'm gonna try to cover 
the main Colorado um, waterfowl. So first of all, there's parts on a bird that you should know if you're not familiar with different parts. Um, there are certain characteristics that can really help you identify a um, waterfowl species over other parts. So I've actually highlighted the cheek and the bill and the um, scapulars were supposed to be highlighted. So those are your main ones that on the bird you're gonna see. When it's floating on the water, it's a little easier to watch and see. Um, but when it's in flight, it's totally different depending on how far away it is, depends on what you can see and what you can't see. So be aware of that when you're watching, but I'm gonna try to cover some of those things to look for. Obviously in a half an hour, I'm not gonna give you the skills to like go out there and be superb at identifying it, but I'll talk about a few things that are important to know. Um, so, when the way, when the bird is actually flying, a lot of the parts that are distinguishing or colored differently are going to be the coverts and the secondaries. Typically, the primaries are not. Under the wing is completely different. A lot of times, you can get solid color patterns, but on the top, you're going to get more bar patterns or lines that are distinct to some of the species. So, um, we will see what that has. So didn't mean to do that. And I don't know how to get that back. Okay. So when you're actually looking at ducks that are sitting on the water, which are still, so you can get a good binocular view, you're going to have our puddling or dabbling ducks, the ones that like to stick their butt in the air when they feed. And then you're going to have a diving duck and the diving duck you'll see for a tiny bit and he'll dive underwater. And then you wait it out and he comes up at some point close by. So we actually have, there's distinguishing characteristics between the two when they're actually standing out on the water, which has to do with leg placement. A diving duck is going to have legs more towards the rear and a puddle duck is going to have them more towards the middle. Um, when they go to fly, that's another big part. Obviously you're not going to see their feet very well, but when they go to fly, you're actually going to see one take off a lot better than the other. So a dabbling duck is gonna be able to actually take flights more straight up, whereas a diving duck is gonna struggle more and actually make a run on the water. And so here in Colorado, we have different types of ducks that are um, puddle and diving, and that makes a difference for their behavior and their feeding techniques. So um, the most common puddle duck is actually the mallard. And so your mallard is um, is gonna be mostly distinguished with the male is gonna have a bright green head, but on both the wings, male and female, it's gonna have that nice blue stripe with some white striping on both sides. It's, uh, they've, they're the one of the most common ducks you'll see here in Colorado. The gadwall is actually, to me, the most blah duck that we have. Honestly, if you are looking out on the water and you see a duck and you're wondering, it's kind of pretty normal, nothing much going on. I wonder what that is. Usually it's a gadwall. Um, they don't, they are very just blah. They don't have much about them that's um, very significant. Um, in flight though, they do have black and white on the very armpit of their wing on the upper side, which is helpful. And underneath, under the wing, they actually have um, white co um, coverts. And then they have a actually skinny bill compared to some of the other ducks. Some of the other ducks have some like pretty heavy um, bills, but these gadwalls will actually show the black and white on the wing and a pretty skinny uh, beak. Another puddling duck is the pintail. I think this pintail is gorgeous. They're um, the greyhound species of ducks as that's how the Sibleys describes them. They're actually very slender, very elegant. That long tail, that long neck, that long nose. 
Um, very fun species here in Colorado. They actually on their upper wing have a green and white, the secondaries of the wing um, are green and white, but the tail, their behavior, they're very gorgeous species that we have here in Colorado. Um, the shoveler, he's, he's one of my favorite ducks, but he has a very heavy, heavy bill. The um, male is super gorgeous, a very large bird. Um, but overall, it's, um, it has a very contrasting white underwing, not a lot of color other than that, but definitely the shoveler when you get to see him, he has a very, very heavy bill. Um, when it comes to your teals, you gotta be a little more careful here in Colorado. Um, teals actually um, have special seasons in certain spots of our state. So depending on where you live, you might actually have a specific teal season. And in which case you need to pay attention. We do have three different types of teals here in Colorado. The cinnamon teal is the largest. Um, the male obviously has that red cinnamon color, a lot easier to see, but in reality on wing, the cinnamon teal and the blue wing teal have very similar characteristics, which make it a little harder. The blue wing actually has a crescent along its beak, a crescent of white um, that helps um, you identify it. The female's a little more drab. Obviously, all of our females are gonna be more drab so they can um, safely nest during the nesting season. But the green wing teal is our tiny little guy, super cute. Um, I'll have a confession that of all the waterfowl, I can't hit the big ones. I managed to drop myself a green wing teal, which is like the tiniest target in the sky, but kind of cool once I got him down. But um, that tells you how bad my shooting was. So the green wing teal is a lot smaller, a lot more compact. But he has a green head, but he has green secondaries, which are going to be up here on the back of the wing. Um, and he has a bold whitish buffy bar that's right above the green that helps him be seen. So the cinnamon teal and the blue wing teal are very similar, but the cinnamon is larger and heavier um, and usually an all over dark body. Um, I think the widgeon is probably my favorite duck out there because they always seem to be chatting and talking while they're out on the water. And um, the males honestly look like they ran into a wall of wet paint. And um, I think that that's amusing that they're identifiable because they have a giant white patch right here on the front of their face. Um, they also have a white patch more up here on the shoulder when they're flying, um, but the underside of their wing is also white. I'll pause because I saw a question come in, but I don't know how to get to it. Maybe not. Um, apparently, I'll read that in a second. The question for you, Kathleen, is can you also shoot teal during the regular waterfowl season in addition to the early teal season? Yes, if it's not mentioned specifically with a limit to how many you can take, then it is considered just a part of your general bag limit. The only actual, right now, the only actual specific season for teal has to do with September, but it's only Lake and Chaffee counties. So for the rest of us, if it's not, um, so I'll touch on that for bag limit, um, just like it was before. If it just says duck six, and then the species you shot isn't mentioned, there isn't a specific limit to that species, but it counts towards like, say your six bag limit. Um, when we specifically mention that species, then that's when you're limited to say like one pintail or two canvas back within the total of your six. But if we don't say it, then your teal is open for that. Um, just that right now, 
we only have the September teal in the Lake and Chaffee counties. But other than that, it can be towards your just daily bag limit of a duck. Um, and I'll cover in a minute a few species that are actually federally protected that are never considered a part of your bag limit. But teal itself, unless you're in that September teal season, can just be counted towards your daily limit. And we don't limit how many of uh, male or female or of those three specific species. During that specific teal season, we do limit six total teal, but it actually includes all three species. I write in if I didn't answer that correctly. So I did widget. Um, Bufflehead. So obviously they have a white patch on the head um, and their wing beat is very rapid compared to some of the other ducks that are out there and swimming around. Um, you'll notice that as you start to watch different groups and observe them that you'll start to be able to um, determine or narrow down who your bird actually might be depending on how they fly. Um, same thing with our um, eagles compared to our turkey vultures and to our hawks. So their wing beat has a lot to do with who they are. Randy, I still can't open that if that came up with another question. The question was just a, a distinction of, uh, you mentioned Lake and Chafee counties, but does that also include all areas east of I-25? Lake Chafee counties and east of I-25 would be the teal question. This is your best friend. Worth, gonna, yeah, worth grabbing the book, yeah. I'm going to look up the book right now, and it is, yes, Lake and Chafee counties in all areas east of I-25. There you go. Thank you. I live in Grand Junction. <laughs> so not me, but great question. Thanks for um, clarifying that I didn't answer it all the way. So um, canvas back. They actually have a very unique head shape, a long pointed bill and a very flat forehead, especially the female that you can see. It looks like you kind of squish her down and then pinch the end of her nose. Um, potentially hard to see in flight. However, in flight, the male has mostly a white wing on the, um, on the upper side. So when you're actually seeing it fly on the upper side, it's very white, whereas most other ducks have just a patch of color on the tail end of their wing. Um, another diving duck, you've got your golden eye here in Colorado. Um, I see them a lot in the winter. They're going to have um, on their nose right next to the cheek, they're going to have a white circle. It's not really a crescent like we had on the other species, but it's um, they're actually going to also have a very large white wing patch um, on their wing that um, runs from the fore front like the front of their wing down the side and then they'll have the rest of their primaries down on the side um and so that species um is here mainly during the winter for us here on the western slope and um is potentially out there the two differences between the two different species isn't recognized in the regulations but we do have more than one species of golden eye here in colorado um, we have our redhead, which um, obviously the male stands out <laughs> with his red head. Um, they really like, sh uh, their wing beat is very shallow and slow. So they don't actually like come down and make big wing movements. It's pretty shallow. Um, and the un underside of the wing is mostly white, but on the top side, when you actually start studying it, is mainly pale gray at the back. And then at the front, the forewing portion is actually very just dark in general. Um, so they're not gonna have just at the secondary, so they're not gonna have like a color that some of the mallards and the teals actually have. The red head is just gonna be solid from all the way across top and bottom look a little different in color, but the bottom is definitely gonna be mainly um, pale gray. 
Um, your ring neck duck is found here in Colorado. Overall, the upper part of the wing is very gray. And then the very front part of it is gonna be even a little bit darker. And they have a small white cheek patch, but very um, hard to see. That's on the juvies and the females. It's very hard to see. If they're actually sitting on the water, you will see their beak actually has the ring around the beak on both male and female, but in flight, a lot harder to see. Overall, the wing is very dark and um, you can see that transition of gray and just darker. The ruddy duck, he is my absolute favorite little ducky. He has a nose that looks like it was painted as an afterthought by a four-year-old. It is bright blue. Um, but he's super cute when he's on the water. He loves to like, he, she loves to run around and stick its little tail like straight up in the air. Its tail is super long for the size of the actual duck and um, super cool to watch on the water. And um, when he's actually flying, um, all of his wing is dark on top. It doesn't have a transition of different colors. And he actually has wing beaks that tend to be very rapid and um, quick. And so that just kind of like seems correct for me for a tiny little duck where he's got to make up for it by being like really hyper and super annoying. So um, the ruddy duck is here in Colorado. Very awesome to watch, but um, a very blue beak. Very small and compact, but his head is pretty big for the size of his body and his tail is super long. The scop, if you'd notice in the regulations, there's actually been added where there is a limit to most of the scop that you can take. The biggest take home for the scop for me is when he sits on the water, the side of him is super, super white or gray in color. Um, in flight, the um, top side of the wing is uh, in the secondary portion is very white. The rest of it is gray. And um, other than that, when they're on the water, they're easier to tell. Their sides just look like you've painted them with a little block of color, um, which makes them easy to identify. But we do have limits on scop here in Colorado. The wood duck, very cool duck. Um, he actually has a very deep, wing beat, which means he tries to like clap his wings on the front below him and clap them over his head behind him when he's flying. He actually has a very long tail, but a short bill. And he has kind of like a helmet head, like he's, um, there's a lot going on up there because they have extra plumage that comes off the top. And um, the very end of the primaries, just right here, looks like they, sorry, my arm disappears. It looks like, it looks like they, uh, never mind. It looks like they totally just painted the very edge of their primaries on their wing with a little bit of white, but um, the wood ducks are super cute. They like to sit to the edges of a lot of streams and they like wooded areas and they themselves, um, gorgeous, gorgeous bird. The females, if you can see them, actually have a white, white circle around their eye and um, a very cool bird. So we'll get into geese, which are a totally different waterfowl to hunt. You don't hunt them the same way as you hunt the rest of our ducks. But here in Colorado, we literally call it a um, dark geese or white geese or light geese. And so with your Canadian geese, you actually have the white fronted, the illusion Canadian geese and the Canada goose. Um, and then simply put, we also have the white, um, the light geese. And you're gonna have your snow geese and your Ross's geese. These on the wing, obviously you're gonna see the dark or you're gonna see the light. And that's how you determine the difference of those. Um, and I added in trumpeter swan last year, there was an issue where a hunter accidentally shot a swan thinking it was a snow goose. Um, and in reality, he did everything correct. He actually just turned himself in. He went, collected the bird, cleaned it and turned himself in. Um, it was a mistake, 
but honestly, there are things you can look at the neck length, the leg length, the flight behavior, the noises they make to determine that um, the swan actually isn't a um, waterfowl species that we can harvest here in Colorado. Sandhill crane, I also threw that one in here so that, um, actually, let me go back for a quick second. Um, here in Colorado, the trumpeter swan is a non-game wildlife species, which includes loons, grebes, pelicans, herons, egrets, and both swans. And they are actually um, accidental take um, if they happen to be a threatened and endangered species is 20 points and um, loss of hunting privileges. However, if it's just a non-game wildlife here in Colorado, it's just five point ticket and a 68 or five points against your um, record and $68 ticket, which is a lot better than 20 points where you lose your hunting. So that's why to have an a open and honest relationship with your district wildlife manager or your local park and the officers there. Um, because sometimes we misidentify and it's just easier to turn yourself in. So I just want to include the swan um, since it was an issue last year, but it is a non-gave species, which means it's not actually takeable here in Colorado. And with that mention, we have the sandhill crane which is actually here in Colorado, a um, small game bird species, which has its own licensing compared to waterfowl. But um, we do have Sand Hill here in Colorado and it is huntable, but not considered under waterfowl. Um, just again, just as you're learning your duck identification, make sure um, you pay attention, you study them, Binoculars are fabulous to help you get a better view. Um, wildlife ID, have it in your bag along with um, the, the regulations if you can. We talk about flock maneuvers. Mallards and pintails and widgeons like to be in loose groups where um, teal and shovelers flash in by small compact groups. Flash is when they fly in. Um, and Canva canvas back shift from waving lines to V's. Habitat, habitat, food, water, shelter space. If you have food, water, shelter space for any species, there's the potential that they'll be there. Puddling ducks like the, the shallow marshes and creeks, which should make complete sense because all they do is flip upside down and as far as their neck can go is where they feed. And divers and whistlers um, like the deeper and open water because they can dive down and get farther down to that food and or chase the prey that's swimming around or moving. Um, then also just ducks at a distance, like I said, same thing. Keep your waterfowl ID with you, keep your binoculars with you. Ways to learn, start just watching online, um, duck IDs, um, your your duck identification books, and then watch silhouettes and listen, because a lot of times you can hear the birds before you even see them. So this is just a little quiz. Yep. Oh, I was just gonna jump in. We had another question that was, what are the legal consequences of shooting the wrong bird if you turn yourself in? And I just wanted to reiterate, um, as long as you do everything right and you turn yourself in, it's really not that big a deal. Again, some of those federally protected species, it's a bigger deal. But the way that the points work on your hunting and fishing privileges is that you have 20 pole. So um, if you turn yourself in and it's just, you have three um, mallard hens, for example, and you're only allowed to have two, um, it's a relatively inexpensive ticket. It's $139.50. And then it's five points assessed against your hunting and fishing privileges. Those are on a five year sliding scale. So as long as you don't make any other mistakes in the next five years, they'll be washed and it's like it never happened. Um, so again, not the biggest of deals. Um, the most important thing is that you just own up to it because inevitably things happen. We find stuff out. Um, it's always good to just be honest and come clean. And just wanted to touch on that, that the points don't last forever. It's on a five year sliding scale and they'll just go away. Thank you. I can't see any of those. <laughs> Um, so this is just real fast to do the end of the ID, but there's only one of me a day. This is a hen canvas back. 
all hens are pretty hard to identify depending on how they're flying or looking. Um, a lot of times if you can see them in a group or on the water, it really helps to um, identify a bit better. But if this bird were to fly up in front of you and you just couldn't put it together or what species it is, it's better just watch it fly, no need to shoot it. Um, what am I, I'll let you pause for a second and see if you can think about this one. This is one I actually did not introduce to you. However, with how pretty boring it is, I probably would have guessed a different species than what it is. So this is actually a black duck. It's very rare here in Colorado, but can turn up and it's actually found in the Eastern flyway. So it is a black duck. <laughs> this one, I like him. I like to listen to these guys. And if you think about what I talked about, he looks like he ran into a wet wall of white paint. So this is a widgeon. He's very, very common here in Colorado. He's fast flying and aerobat um, aerobatic, and he likes to talk. He loves to whistle. So he has a super cute little whistle um, that Justin might be able to do for us later. That's the challenge, at least. This one. This is my duck that has blah, always blah. Nothing about her, nothing crazy. Even the male isn't anything fantastic. It's just a gadwall hen. So if you see a bird out there and you are pretty sure it's just blah, it's probably a gadwall. Sorry, gadwalls, I'm not a fan. And the last one, one of my favorite birds, just because it is majestic and it's super gorgeous and it's so neat to see huge numbers of these birds, but they are um, currently open the entire season and you may have one of them. And the bird is more has a more pronounced tail later in the season. And this is the one I referred to as the greyhound. Sleek and long, very majestic. It's the pintail here in Colorado. And so with that, um, I will try to check into questions, but otherwise I'm gonna actually hand it over to a guru who has a passion for this and much better at it. I call in coyotes, not ducks. So here is Justin. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, that's awesome. And I guess I would add one thing about species that's really cool is she put the black duck in there. Um, that's probably 95% of the species you'll see, but I've personally seen 22 different species of ducks in Colorado, um, just through we're tracking them down from bird watchers. And they also do cool things like hybridize. Um, last year in Fort Collins, it was getting a lot of attention from the birders. There was a hybrid um, Drake Mallard, Drake Pintail cross, and it's just really unique. And so, you know, you could see things out there that you don't know what they are and, and even and you know, and if you're if you're really curious, you can always usually track those things down on the internet. But um, very cool. Um, I also mentioned uh, realized I didn't really cover what backcountry hunters and anglers are, and uh, that is a public lands conservation and advocacy group. Um, we've got a, over 3,000 members in Colorado, um, and I guess I would highlight that because as we start to get into this. I think it's intimidating to get into waterfowling because it is gear intensive and it can be really expensive. And I think worse, there's this idea in it that it has to be those things. And I don't really think that that's true. A, a couple things that I would um, say is joining a conservation organization, uh, Rocky Mountain Sportswomen, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Ducks Unlimited, they do volunteer um, opportunities or um, like re uh, recruitment activities and things. And that's a really good way to go kind of see if you like it before you start to invest. Um, another thing that's not a terrible idea, it's gonna seem really expensive if, if you, uh, when you look into it, but is looking at a guided hunt, you know, in the scheme of things to spend 300 bucks and go and see if you like it and, and get really good access and get really good education. You know, it, it can be something worth considering before you start to invest in gear. And then the last thing is, is what we do a lot of, which is do it yourself on public lands. And, uh, and I'm gonna talk and try and highlight through this how you could do that as a beginner or how I'd start to attack it. But um, with that, we're gonna start talking about gear and, and we're gonna uh, kick it off with some duck calls. Um, kind of a key uh, to 
to duck hunting are, are probably one of the things that makes it the most fun here, uh, or, or one of the most fun things about duck hunting is calling them. And so the first thing is uh, all these ducks can make different or make different sounds for the most part. And, but 90% of what we're talking about when we're talking about duck calling is a hen mallard quack or a hen mallard call. Um, when you hear duck calling or people talk about it, um, most of the competition calling, which is a whole nother thing, is, um, is going to be replicating a, a hen mallard call. Um, that is like the quack that we all know. I don't know how well this is going to sound through it, but um, this is a call lanyard here. So I've got all kinds of different calls, whistles, um, things like that. But like a hen mallard would just be a very standard um, quack. And, and, you know, and, and getting a duck call and I would point you to Google and there's a ton of resources out there to just start with being able to make a quack is a really great way to do. And it's a really effective way uh, to call. I think that a lot of people even really experienced waterfowlers don't just make simple, easy, soft duck sounds. And so um, that's something I would do. I don't think you have to spend a lot of money here on a duck call. Um, you know, Walmart has a ton of different waterfowling stuff. And I would say, you know, uh, go cheap. And if you like it, then you can start to think about where you want to get nicer gear. But, you know, getting a call, I think as a beginner, it's not, there's not going to be a lot of difference in it. Um, you're going to see some things where they talk about the numbers of reads in calls. You're usually going to see a single or a double read call for a beginner, or a new waterfowler. A, a, a single read call is going to be a little bit easier. Um, and then I would just say, get that call, um, mess around with a little bit. And, and there's just a ton of videos on Google and, and YouTube where you can really start to learn to call. Um, so these are different. The, the calls on this PowerPoint here are going to be different um, mallard, hen mallard sounds for the most part. Um, feed call, greeting call. They're just different combinations of that clock and at different urgencies and at different um, cadences, different volumes. But um, so that's going to be 90% of duck calling. Um, some of the species that we saw, and I think is a really good thing to highlight for a new hunter, is a whistle. A, a lot of ducks whistle. And one of the things that I really like about uh, whistling is um, ducks don't seem to get too sensitive to it. There are times when you're hunting around ducks that have had a lot of pressure where they are not going to respond to calls. In fact, sometimes you're going to think that they went the other way when they heard your call and you actually might be right. And so I don't see ducks respond like that. And I also think that in my experience, most ducks that whistle will respond to kind of any combination of whistle, whether or not it hits that. You know, you can, uh, some, of the, some of the species that whistle, um, probably the easiest thing you can do is, and you could do it with a lot of different whistles, but would be a little teal call. And that's just gonna be a, a quick pipe, like. And you'll, you'll hear them do that on the wall, uh, water. But widgeons and pintails, these other whistling ducks, if you're just doing that little um, whistle, they'll probably respond to it too. The other thing you can do that's a really just generic duck whistle that'll work is, is just kind of a, a shrill, we call it, or. And that is probably, you're gonna see pintails, you're gonna see teal, you're gonna see widgeon respond to it. And quite honestly, that, that, that call that I just did is, has some characteristics of both what a widgeon sounds like and a pintail sounds like, but they just don't seem to be really sensitive to it. I think the like the barriers of entry on on whistling for ducks is a lot lower and and uh, and can be really effective. So I'd encourage you to do that. Plus, I think this whistle call I'm using is about eight bucks or something like that. So um, a very cheap cheap way to get out there and make some duck sounds. Um, and yeah, and so that's a what I would talk about with duck calling. Um, and, and it's really just kind of a trial and error. Um, and going back to trying to find a mentor or a group that can point you in the direction or, or you know, if it's something that you think you can afford or want to do, um, hooking up with an outfitter. There are even some pretty reasonable outfitters along the um, front range that'll even take you on public land and that'll knock down the cost, but it'll be a really good learning opportunity. But so that gives you a little rundown on duck calls. Um, the next thing we're, uh, we're going to talk about today on the next slide is shotguns and shells. Um, you know, I think traditionally you're going to see most people hunt ducks with a, a 12 gauge shotgun, probably a pump action or a semi-auto. 
Um, but one thing I would also say that if, if, if you're a beginner or new hunter or you're going to be around beginner or new hunters, they can be a little bit more expensive, but there's some more inexpensive options out there of, of break action shotguns. So that would be a, a double barrel shotgun, either side by side or over and under. And, and one of the things I like about that with having new hunters is I just, you just always know what's going on there. Um, you know, if the gun's open, it's safe. It, it, you know, it just is a really good way to learn. Um, I've used that to introduce new hunters. And, and while they do tend to be a higher price point, there are some really reasonable ones out there. And, and I think when you're talking about safety or getting kids into duck hunting, um, I think that's really key. And, and I do also feel that in a lot of ways, duck hunting has some of the most potentials for, for accidents to happen. You know, um, we talked about barrel safety and, and all the things that we do. And and the reality is I've seen experienced hunters where um, get yelled at because they're throwing off their safety before they should. And, and when, when you're out in a duck blind, you're in close quarters with people. There's multiple shotguns there. There's ducks flying everywhere. So it's really hard. It's hard to stress the safety. And I don't want to intimidate people by that, but I do think it's, uh, uh, it's important to talk about. And so, I, you know, we're sticklers that, you know, the safety doesn't come off until you're on a duck um, ready to shoot, uh, you know, just really watching that. And, and I would just reiterate, I really like having break action shotguns around when I'm with new hunters or, or, uh, mentored hunters. Cause I just, I really know what's going on there. I can help them. Um, when I take out, I've got my bird dog behind me, but when I take out new hunters in the upland, I always go that route too, because I can have them have a shotgun open all the way up into a pointing dog and then close it. And so not to go around knowing your guns and, um, not understanding that, but I do think that that, that is something that, that I'd say is, I think is a good tip for people, especially they don't have it. Kathleen. So I would love to add with that, um, with Hunter outreach, we really talk about getting to know your, um, firearm, whatever you have. And there is no situation that you should be walking around with a loaded firearm. If you don't have enough time to identify your target and actually load your firearm and take your safety off and shoot safely shoot, then it doesn't need to happen. And in reality, people hear that and they think that that takes a lot of time, but as good conservationists and shooters and hunters, you practice with your firearm and all of what I just said can happen in under half a second. Um, rifle shooting or shotgun shooting, um, you, accidents don't happen on purpose. Accidents actually happen when we don't mean it to happen and stars will align. You will hurt someone or yourself and shotguns have the tendency to do that, especially just like we talked about earlier, when you're leaning against something, there is no need to have one in the chamber until you are ready to fire. You could totally load it, take your safety off, accurately line it up and make a safe shot without ever just wandering around with a loaded firearm. So if, if, anything from this 101 ever goes home to you it's there is no need to walk around or sit with a loaded firearm when in reality you could identify your target load it take your safety off and fire all within the amount of time to take the bird down so just make sure you always stay safe that's what we always want to promote here in our state and across like everywhere where you hunt. But I totally back that up, Justin, that it is one thing people think that they have to have unloaded and it's never appropriate. Yep. Awesome, thanks for that. And, uh, and so just a little bit more about like what types of shotguns. I think that you can adequately hunt ducks with a 20 gauge. Um, I've done it a whole lot. Um, some of the, what they do with the new loads and steel shot and things like that um, are fine in a 20 gauge. In fact, I think for, a, a lot of hunters that's a, a better gun um to use um for duck hunting i think goose hunting you start to kind of push that but even then i've seen it be really effective and it comes down to range and picking your shots and and one of the things i know about the best um shots i i know in in the field um as much as that's talent and experience shooting it's actually they're really good at picking their shots they don't they don't take shots that they don't think they're gonna hit they let the birds get close um, and, and they're really disciplined in that. And, and that's a really good key for safety too. So something to think about, but I think a 20 gauge or a, a 12 gauge is great. I think you get less than that. There's a lot of kind of bravado out there and trying to shoot 28 gauges and things like this. And, and I, I just think it's unnecessary. I think it gets past it. So, um, 
I guess a couple things, size of shot shell. I really like to shoot twos at ducks. Um, shotgun shells have different sizes on them. So uh, the higher the number, the smaller the shell. If you're hunting doves, you're talking about eight shot, seven and a half shot pheasants, usually fours and sixes. Um, a lot of people hunt ducks with fours, um, but I really like to shoot twos because I, I just, I, I mean, it, it sounds silly, but you, you can't shoot them too dead, right? Um, and you don't want to damage the meat, but uh, even with a bird dog, I would say we probably retrieve 90 to 95% of our ducks. They swim out onto a lake and it's freezing and it's December and the lake's 800 yards across, you know, you can send someone else's dog, but mine's not going after it. Or we can go try and get it on the other uh, shore. So I, I usually go a little overshot on both ducks and geese because I, I'd rather have a little bit more meat loss um, than just total bird loss. But that's a preference. I don't think it's unethical or unreasonable to shoot fours, uh, four shot at ducks. Um, the last thing I would say about shotguns and shells is um, I think this really plays in nice with um, bird identification. Um, flock shooting is a, a term we have in, in duck hunting where you get excited and everyone does it. I've, I, I saw one of my buddies that I've hunted with for years and is one of the most experienced people this year, get up, get excited. We were like, what happened? Did you get what he said? I flock shot him. I just didn't pick a target and I didn't hit anything. And so um, not only would that cause mo potentially more wounded birds, which we never want to do, um, but it won't help with your identification. It won't make you a better hunter. And so back to the identification, when ducks, when you're starting to see ducks and they're in a group, watching how they're flying, um, but also trying to never look at the group. I don't look at the group when they're 70, 80, 100 yards out. I'm already trying to pick a duck. That helps me through the whole process of watching them circle your decoys and come in, focus on one duck and never let that kind of flock view come into, come into my uh, vision. I also think that you're going to find it easier to identify ducks um, notice the different flight patterns and things like that. So just a tip there. Um, next thing on gear, you know, once again, you can go and buy thousand dollar waders now and super expensive layering systems. And I'm as guilty as anyone of, of being a gearhead and liking that. And, and I also don't want people to think you have to do that. I think, um, you know, to get started, I think that if you have, um, some waders, I, I would suggest actually the first duck hunt, if I was to do a uh, DIY duck hunt, I would go early in the year and I would go to a mountain pond. Um, the ducks are going to be close. They're not going to be super educated. You're less likely to have pressure. It's not going to be cold. You could use your fly fishing waders easily at that time of year in a, in a mountain beaver pond that has some ducks on it or um, things like that on, on forest service land. It is oftentimes not going to have as much pressure as um, state wildlife areas on those openers. And um, so, you know, having some camo, I, I don't think you need to have a real specific pattern. Um, I think that most greens and drab colors, I think, uh, you know, uh, surplus army gear would work for 90% of duck hunts. Um, but I would say layers, um, waterproof, um, and, and camouflage, and you'll be fine. I really stress layers. Um, duck hunting might be the worst for the getting the hottest and the coldest. Um, you're walking in with all your gear, and you're dressed for zero degrees or even 30 degrees, and, and you work up a sweat. And then you're trying to sit still in that same same temperature, and it's just miserable. So uh, I would say, you know, hit the trail cold, um, put out your decoys cold, start cold, um, and get moving around and use that movement while you're setting up and getting your blind together. We're going to talk about that stuff, um, and then layer up as soon as you sit down, because no matter it, the better you regulate that, the the uh, uh, happier you're going to be out there. And and it says right here, cold feet, um, short hunts, cold hands, cold face. Uh, cold body, like being cold is miserable, especially with new hunters or if you're getting kids into it or anything like that's just going to make it really hard. And there's ways to do that without spending a ton of money, um, you know, repurposing your big game camo, but layering it down, um, trying to be waterproof, using some waders earlier in the season. I do think that as you get later, you're going to want more insulated waders. You're going to want things like neoprene, um, wait, you know, can be really good, but also I would caution you to fall in the trap that you need to get it all to go out there the first time and, and, uh, and go from there. So um, kind of on close, that, that's kind of how I'd look at it. Yeah. So just from a women's perspective and a kid's perspective, um, they do make gear out there specifically for women. So if you're a person who normally can't fit in a unisex boot, 
then I would suggest going for the women's stuff. It's not any sexier than the man's stuff, but the boot itself actually fits you as a female. Um, I totally reiterate with layers. Um, so many people get caught up in um, all the camo and all the expensive stuff you could buy. As long as you have layers and a way to stay dry, I am a short female. So as long as you have chest waders, because guaranteed your buddy's going to walk through something deeper than your hip boots can handle. Um, me, for me, the more warm I am, I'm okay if I'm sweating because that means like when it gets cold, I'm still going to be warm. Hand warmers go a long way. Anything to warm yourself up. Um, just like you said, hike in and then add your layers in. But they do make female specific um, I don't necessarily like promote, like you need your own female waiters, but in reality, um, if that's the stuff that fits you with kiddos, um, that's the kind of stuff that fits with the kid style versus the adult. Because honestly, if you really want them to get into it and you have them trudge half a mile to your blind and they rub their feet raw, they're not going to go back out. If they're standing there and you think you're warm and they're freezing their little heinies off, nobody wants to play that game. So make sure when you think to yourself, like, I don't think we need this extra layer, probably go ahead and take it just in case it's okay to carry a little bit heavy, but you definitely don't have to drink the Kool-Aid about the expensive gear, but I'll agree with Justin. It's kind of fun to drink the Kool-Aid occasionally. Um, cause there's some pretty cool stuff out there and you feel pretty hip about it, but as long as you make sure you are warm, layered up, and you have what you need, you're going to have fun. Even if that means a borrowed firearm or lots of layers that don't necessarily match, it's totally okay. But I agree with Justin that it is fun sometimes to buy the gear that's like totally duck gear. So, but it, there is it one is. specific. Yeah, it's fun. And there's awesome stuff out there. The other stuff is thinking about gear you can use other places. Like there's a lot of applications for some really thick, good merino wool um, base layers and base layers. You can use that anywhere, even if you never duck hunt again. And that's the stuff that's going to keep you warm more than the exterior layers. The other thing is having a thermos, some hot cocoa, like kind of warms the spirit, keeps you going when you're sitting there and there's not a lot of action. So um, that, that's, you know, having some hot beverages, or I even take sometimes tomato soup out in a, in a thermos and that's great to drink out there, um, broth or things like that. So that, that's another way to, to stay warm. And so, um, I guess the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about decoys. Um, once again, uh, uh, this is just a huge hole you can fall in. And, and this is where, you know, getting a mentor or even looking at a guide or something like that is going to start to save you money, you know? Um, but you can do it yourself. Um, there's some groups on Facebook, waterfowl groups and stuff that people sell used gear all the time. They save gear heads that, uh, do it because they like to buy gear. Um, they sell that gear too, all the time at a deal. They love to help new hunters. Um, they like to take people out. And so, um, you know, there's some options around that and, and there's nothing wrong with used decoys. It's fun to paint decoys. I spend a lot of time in the winter painting decoys, not so much because it saves as much money. I just kind of enjoy doing it. And it's, um, you can get, you know, uh, uh, exterior house paint and, and paint decoys up. And, and that's another way to kind of learn some duck identification. But um, you, by and large, are going to need decoys to hunt ducks um, in the funnest way possible. So um, jump shooting ducks is also fun. That's a, a tactic where you know where some ducks are or they're roosting or they're on the water and you sneak up on them. And when they get up, you shoot them. Um, you certainly don't need um, decoys for that. But um, I think the thing that really sets deco or waterfowl hunting apart and maybe not apart because certainly, you know, in turkey hunting and, and, and some, and a lot of other applications, you get to interact with animals like that, but watching ducks work a, a, a decoy spread and, uh, come in and, and kind of fooling them is, is a really big part of that. And so, um, you know, getting a couple used decoys is a good thing to do, um, and then we can, there's a ton of different ways. We're going to get in the weeds here a little bit. This is awesome, super detailed presentation, but these spreads and tricks um, are awesome. Um, you know, but you're going to need, but you know, it, it's starting to get to um, in the weeds a little bit. And what I would say is you want to look like ducks out there. Um, 
relaxed ducks are usually spread out on, on a pond. They're going to be a little less spread out, not in a big group, sitting along the edges. That's a good way to look. Um, these are some really, on this slide, some really classic um, on the decoy spreads and trick slide are, are some really classic, um, are some different classic spreads. So um, on a river, um, which is a really great way to hunt with a lot less decoys. I don't think you need as many decoys as on a pond uh, or, or certainly like on, on a big reservoir, but on a river, um, ducks are usually going to hang out in areas where they don't have to work a lot. If they're sitting out there in the current, um, they're burning calories. They're not, they're not staying warm. They're not going to do that. So usually when I'm looking for a place to hunt on a river, I'm looking for a place I can put a blind, like on this slide. Um, that might just be a tree that comes close to the river that I feel like I can pile some brush up around and get up against and hide. Um, and trees are really good because they're going to have overhead cover. The ducks are going to be flying over you. And so sometimes people put a lot of work in, in getting the front of them covered and, and it doesn't work as well because the ducks fly over and see them. So finding a tree on a river bend and, and getting some brush around, it's really good. Um, in this case, I would also look for a place that um, might have a tree in the water or some kind of the inside of a bank um, that's gonna have less flow, just kind of reading that water and looking where, where, where you'd wanna hang out for the day and not, not be pedaling your fit, little feet off all day. Um, and putting a couple decoys there. Um, generally, when we're talking about decoy spreads, we're gonna have a landing zone. So we're gonna spread up, spread out our decoys um, in little groups. And then we're going to have an open spot and ducks usually when they come in, they're gonna to wanna to land in a spot where they have room to land, but it's also protected by other ducks on the water. And, and so um, you're gonna recreate that when you're doing a decoy setup. So here on a river, uh, you'd be in the blind and, and where it says landing zone is that open area. And that's where it's ideal to shoot. You also sometimes wanna think about where the sun is. If the sun's at your back, you can hide better. It's not in your eyes and uh, you'll be able to, be more effective when it comes to shooting. But, um, you know, I think it's kind of the, the spots you think you'd see ducks or, or just paying more attention when you're driving around and where you see ducks, you, you replicate those things and you can do pretty well. Um, the next is, is a pond or a lake. Um, that's the next setup. It's similar things um, to the river. Uh, you don't have a current you don't have to worry about, but you do really want to worry about the wind here. So um, ducks are going to land into the wind. So if you have a north wind, you're gonna to wanna to be on the north side of the lake. Um, that way, uh, first of all, you're gonna have a clearer shot at their vitals when they're coming into your decoys, ideally, and you're gonna have cleaner kills. Um, you're gonna have a bigger target. And as they start to check their speed and land into the wind, that they're gonna slow down um, and make them a little easier to hit. And so um, ducks usually, um, you know, hang out, look into the wind on a lake too. So usually when you have a decoy, you're gonna have a decoy and then it's gonna have um, a, a weight on it. And so it's got a keel under the decoy and then it's gonna have a weight on it. That weight's gonna be on the front of the keel. So your decoys always look into the wind. So as you're looking at, at this diagram, um, if you were setting this up, um, you know, you'd want the wind coming from behind the blind and it's the same thing. The other thing you're gonna notice here is they have these diver species on the outside of um, the spread. That's really common because those ducks are gonna be out um, chasing invertebrates, uh, little fish, things like that, and tend to hang out and feed in deeper water. Um, the dabbler ducks, which are gonna also eat some of those same foods, but um, in addition to some vegetation and things like that are gonna be hanging out on, um, on the edges. Um, you know, the, the thing I would say too is uh, this is a good time to talk about um, how people can scout for ducks. And I think sometimes it's like, I don't know that I can't do that. Um, but scouting is really just watching. And so if you can get a chance and you know where there's some ducks, even if you'll never be able to hunt them, go watch them. Um, you'll start to notice things um, when it's real warm out and the lows and the temperatures aren't getting below 30, they're going to hang out on those lakes. They're going to eat on those lakes or go to to wetlands along the shores or nearby marshes, and they're gonna eat a lot of um, what we call soft soil foods. Um, when it starts to get cold and you're out east in ag land, those same ducks are usually gonna come up off that lake at some point, sometimes right before dark, sometimes in the morning, they're gonna fly out and land in, in um, grain fields like geese. And we're gonna talk about goose hunting where you traditionally hunt them in fields because they do that um, a little bit more predictably. But 
Um, you know, scouting, I think sometimes is a, a, can be an intimidating word because, um, you, know, you know, it kind of, I don't know, I, I think it just kind of gets a mind of its own, but really we're just talking about watching, um, watching wildlife. That's really hard to do in big game. It's hard to find and watch wildlife on public land, but there's a lot of places you can go watch and learn a lot about how to set up decoys and how to hunt ducks. Um, you know, in town and in, in steamboat, uh, right. As you get outside of town, there's a pond and it's always full of mallards and those ducks, uh, when it's snowy, they head down to the river. And, um, when it's sunny, they, they hang out and feed there all day. And you'll notice those things and you can start to use those to, uh, to be successful hunting. So, um, I know that's a super quick overview of, of duck hunting, but I hope it's a little bit helpful and, and starts to get you some of the terminology and, and some of the ways you can kind of get in and go be successful. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about goose hunting. I'm going to admit that I, uh, I don't do a whole lot of goose hunting. Um, and one of the reasons I don't do that is I do think that the, the barriers of entry are, are higher. Um, certainly out on the front range it, there, you know, I, I was joking before this call that it sometimes feels like a spending contest of people with trailers and thousands of decoys and field leases and things like that. And, and, you know, you can still be successful doing it yourself on public land, but I, I do think that it's harder than duck hunting. Um, and, and generally geese, um, by the time you're going to really hunt them, they're going to be hanging out in bigger groups. They're going to be set in patterns, but we're still going to talk about this a little bit. So we did the um, identification um, earlier. So same thing here. Uh, you're, I don't see a lot of snow geese in Colorado until I get east of I-25 and even then quite a bit we east I-25. Um, I just, I, I don't see them a whole lot along the front range, but once you get out past Greeley and things like that, you start to see them in huge groups. Um, Jumbo Reservoir and Pruitt Reservoir right now probably have, um, honestly, no exaggeration, um, upward of 40 or 50,000 snow geese on them. I mean, it's really incredible to see them come and go all day. Um, you get on the front range and you're gonna see a lot of these different Canada geese. Um, and, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about hunting them, um, locations. So the next thing, um, the next slide is a little bit about locations for goose hunting. Um, you know, I, I talked about scouting already a little bit on duck hunting. I think in any waterfowling, you really got to, um, just, just know where there's some ducks are and drive around and, and or, or geese. But, um, what is unique about geese and, and in some ways has kind of fed that, um, the, the, the big decoy spreads and the trailers and the leases is geese tend to get on a really set pattern and they do the same things over and over. So they're usually going to roost on water at night. Um, they're usually going to go out and feed. Uh, they don't feed at different times as much as geese. That's not entirely true. Certainly um, snowstorms and things like that will change it, but um, you're going to see geese do, be on a, on a more of a pattern. And so in this slide, that's what they're talking about is scouting and starting to identify some of those patterns. So um, finding the X, the X, the term of usually associated with where a big goose feed is. Um, and it is really kind of a, astonishing. You get in December and, and January and you can get out um, around some ag areas and you can see really incredible numbers of waterfowl go into an individual cornfield. And, uh, you know, they'll do funny stuff. I've, I've chased uh, geese and ducks for, 14 miles one time from a roof over 14 miles of cornfield to go to that one cornfield and you know if anyone can answer why they would fly for 14 miles of cornfields to go to one specific cornfield um i'd sure like to know but that's what they're talking about when we're talking about the finding the x and scouting and with geese that's just going to be a very much more set pattern um i'm actually not sure exactly on this slide what they mean by traffic geese um, so if anyone knows, they can uh, uh, hit up there, hit that up. You know, the field of dreams, I think that's back to a field that they're feeding on over and over and you just know they're there. Um, and then, you know, public land goose hunting, uh, there are um, walk-in opportunities. There's SWAs that have active ag leases on them um, that have field hunting and things like that. And so you can certainly do it, um, but they're just, in my experience, harder to break off their pattern uh, than ducks. And so um, I'd get out there and try it. Um, you know, once again, trying to pick up some used decoys or, or hook up with a mentor, or, um, things like that. It's a good way to, um, to check it out. I think the further you get away from the, the big populated corridors of Colorado, um, the more likely are going to, are to get permission. So, um, 
And, and, you know, not all permissions are the same. There's a, uh, if you get away from where it's kind of been commercialized and people don't care about um, goose hunting, like you get far out East, they might not care. They might never let you hunt whitetail deer out there or turkeys or pheasants, but they might really not care if you go out and hunt ducks and geese. And we've certainly run into that in, um, in Eastern Colorado. And so, you know, it never hurts to respectfully go up and, and knock on a door if you, if you see, um, any game that you want to hunt and ask it, the worst they're going to say is, is no. And, um, and so that, that's something I would try and try to do. And if you do get permissions on geese or ducks and, and they're on private land, um, they'll probably, there's a good chance they'll, they'll keep going back to that until, um, they're disrupted and, and sent out of there. So, um, that, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Um, so, you know, I, oh, sorry. Justin, just for you, I looked it up and because nobody knows what traffic geese is, but it basically means you're aiming to direct birds into your field and decoy spread. Birds that otherwise have better places to go will go there. So in reality, it's just you hope they come into your spread. Yep. Or yeah, or you put out enough decoys. And I mean, that's where you do see some pretty crazy stuff. If you're at a gas station in Greeley, Colorado on a Saturday morning at 6 a.m., you might see 40 foot trailers full of duck or goose decoys as people head out there. And so they're really trying to get those geese that are set on a pattern to get off that pattern and, and set a new one and come into those decoys. So um, awesome. You know, uh, hiding, with, I guess the last thing I would say with geese is blinds. Uh, people use coffin blinds, um, blankets. I've seen people like kind of weave together corn stalks into a uh, um, mesh nets and, and cover themselves with that. That is another challenge of geese, uh, of goose hunting is that uh, generally you're in a field and there's not a lot of cover in a field like next to a pond or, or, or next to a river. And so, um, you know, some of the things you can think about is setting up next to a fence row um, or if there's some standing crop out there left over that, that didn't get cut using those. But that's something when you're looking at a place to hunt geese, that's probably as much as where those geese are going. Um, where you can hide is going to dictate probably where you hunt. Um, cause if you can't hide, it doesn't matter if you're sitting right where they were the day before. So, um, yeah. All right. Goose calls. Um, I actually don't even have a goose call. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, a, one of the other real draws to goose hunting is they can be very, very responsive to calls. Um, some people would try and argue more so than ducks. I, I think that's kind of splitting hairs there. Um, but you know, when you're interacting with game and um, that's probably the, the common denominator on, on the things I like to hunt for me are, are things I can talk to. I love to turkey hunt. I like to archery elk hunt and I like to duck hunt. And, and, and that's the thing that um, really draws me to those things. And so, um, you know, getting a goose call, um, I would suggest getting a flute call. There's going to be two different sizes um, calls. The short ones are, can sound better and more realistic. Um, you can make more of these listed sounds with them, um, but they're also really hard to master. Whereas a flute call, you can certainly sound like a goose and, and it's a little easier to learn. So if I, if I was going out to, to start goose hunting and wanted a call, I'd probably start with a flute call. Once again, not super expensive, certainly less than 30 bucks, um, probably find them for 20 bucks. Um, and, and then, you know, it's the, the, um, evolution of calling is, is starting with just being able to make some animal sounds. It's a good, good start. Um, and then, you know, with waterfowl, let's get out there over your decoys and make some, make some duck or goose sounds, um, as you go. And as you enjoy it more, um, all of these different types of calls, um, all these different scenarios, you can get a lot of information and, and go with that. Um, you know, these are different, uh, what's listed here are different, um, sounds that geese are going to make in different scenarios. And, and it's back to, um, pretty much um, volume of the sound, uh, um, kind of the urgency and the cadence, um, starting with that that cluck, just like I was uh, uh, doing a quack with the ducks. So, um, yeah, I'm, I I I wish I could tell you a little bit more about goose calling, but it's it's not my strongest point. Oh, um, awesome. Sorry, I I got a little ahead of me on concealment and blinds. So. Uh, ahead of myself on concealment and blinds earlier, but um, you know, a lot of what I was saying, uh, this is probably going to dictate your, how you're going to hunt in a field um, for geese. Uh, you know, you're going to want to find a place that geese are using or at least flying over. Um, 
And then you're gonna wanna put out your decoys in a way you can hide. Um, there's a lot of things you can buy or build to do that. But um, I, I think you're always best off kind of reading the landscape if there's a, if a, if there's a depression or a ditch um, going through something, if you can set up on a, on a uh, fence row or cattails. Um, you know, we list li layout blinds here. Um, so those uh, coffin blinds or layout blinds um, are basically um, usually fabric blinds that you can set up in the field, lay down, um, add some of the stubble from around yourself. And then um, they're gonna have two doors on top that swing out and you can sit up. So you're actually laying in the field. Um, and when you're ready to shoot, uh, you can throw those, those uh, cloth doors open. I uh, usually have some kind of frame with them and sit up and shoot. And so that's what they're talking about there. And that's, that's probably the most popular way to hunt geese except for a pit. And then uh, a pit is generally when someone either pays or, or digs it themselves and they actually go out into one of these ag fields and they're gonna sink in a pit. Um, if you wanna have some fun, you can see some really elaborate pits. I've seen them with uh, full kitchens underground in them. Um, you know, uh, uh, you can see them with uh, satellites popping up, especially when you get out in Nebraska and it's Husker season. They all seem to sit out and watch football. I don't even know if they really duck or goose hunt sometimes in those pits. Um, uh, but that, that's what that refers to. Um, covering your face. It seems really silly to paint your face sometimes. And, and there's certainly a lot of jokes. And when you go into the gas station, when you're done and, and you have your face painted, uh, you can feel a little awkward. But um, it is really amazing when you see um, some drone footage or overhead footage of, of people hunting and how easy it is to pick out a human face. So um, you know, putting a little uh, black camouflage face paint on your on your face just to kind of dole it down is is a really good idea, especially if you're close to your decoys or, or if you're laying in a in a layout blind or um, or where your face is really exposed. Kathleen, so, I feel like teacher calling on you. So, <laughs> with that, I just want to comment like. We talked about waterfowl and waterfowl ID. It's super important when it comes to colors with waterfowl, um, when it comes to their wing patterns, the colors that show up on that. Um, camouflaging yourself is super important for waterfowl hunting because they are a bird who are attracted by what their male looks like. They, there's a reason the plumage is so gorgeous and each species has a certain look to them. They're very color oriented. So if you think about the simple fact that I said the underside of a wing is very white or on the upper side, they have a white wing bar, those kind of things really show up. So if you have gone to all this effort to get into a blind, you've put, the vegetation around you and you're wearing camouflage and your face is just standing out at whatever color it is as a solid color, that is a huge thing that any waterfowl see and actually will be a deterrent. When they come in and they start cupping their wings for that landing, if they see you, they're gonna turn, they're gonna abort the landing because they're terrified about what's going on because something's out of place and they see it. They waterfowl truly pick up on color because that's how their males show off and who gets to mate and here you are making all the other efforts and spending all the money on your camo and your guns camo yourself is camo and there is your face no matter what color your face is it's shining as a solid color that these birds actually recognize so that's why I mentioned earlier, when you're hiking in and hiking out, you can wear your orange so that other people see you. But when you're actually hunting, you do need to blend in with your vegetation because these birds are very much about color. It's what they see, it's how they mate, it's how they function. So it is super important. And, and then the other thing I would add to that is movement. So um, I actually did something last year with, with some of the people I hunt and uh, uh, I got out my phone and recorded uh, what they look like every time someone said, don't move. And inevitably everyone ducked down real fast and they moved real fast. Well, waterfowl are really gonna pick up on movement, especially on a still day. So um, being perfectly still out there is really important. And if you are moving or if you think there's, you know, you're in a bad position instead of moving real quick and trying to get there and, and pulling that attention to yourself, you know, trying to slowly get down or, and, and, you know, and minimizing movement is going to be huge out there. Um, and things like painting your face and, and, and having camo are going to help you cover that. So 
All right. Um, so the next piece of gear, and, and we were talking about traffic geese, which is the thing I learned tonight, um, is a goose flag. And so um, back to that movement piece, um, duck, ducks and geese are going to always be looking for other waterfowl. They, they're gregarious. They want to be with other waterfowl. And one of the ways they really identify that is looking for wing beats on ducks. Um, I kind of missed it on the slide, but uh, they have things that spin wings in different um, motion decoys to draw attention over there. Um, and that's going to flash looking like a wing. This is uh, an example that you use for goose hunting and it's a goose flag. And so uh, what people are going to do is there's a handle on it and they put it real high and they, and they flag it down. And um, they're going to do that at, at waterfowl. Um, it actually would work for ducks too. They're going to do that at waterfowl, um, you know, probably starting at as far as four and 500 yards. And, and they're going to usually stop using a goose flag um, when, when they get real close, start to get into shooting a distance, but it's really to get attention to your spread. Um, you know, ducks and geese are looking for places to feed or places to roost. And one of the ways they see that is watching other birds fly in there, um, and land in there. And so this is mimicking that and, and getting some attention to, to your spread of goose decoys. So, um, uh, you know, so when you're in late season, the hard, the later you get into waterfowl season, the trickier it, is, it gets to hunt. So you need to either have more motion or less motion. And it's always this balance of going back and forth. Um, sometimes they love it when you flag them a lot and sometimes they spook like crazy. And that's kind of probably even comes down to those individual groups of birds experiences. If they, if they went a couple times and they saw a flag and got shot at and, and didn't get hit, um, they're probably pretty wary of it. If they've just been watching birds land time after time, this motion is going to make them feel really, really good about what they're seeing. And, and that kind of goes, you've, you've seen it throughout the slideshow, we've talked about reading the birds and, and, you know, and that's just watching them and but really paying attention to the nuance of how they behave. So, um, and, and the more you watch birds, um, and that's the cool thing about ducks and geese is you can go watch them on the public pond, ponds and places you can't hunt where you can really see a good view. But the more you watch them, the more you're going to see how those things translate to hunting and and the more like nuance to those different movements and, and and that'll be really helpful for you so justin and hunter outreach we always talk about like every failed attempt leads to learning and how to manage and work that species and so that every failed attempt actually leads up to a very successful event so don't get overwhelmed by everything we tell you and how to do it and this and that just go try it, yep. learn about it and try it. And everything will add up to a phenomenal experience. Yep, and my, my grandfather said, used to say, uh, what do you get when you don't get nothing? He'd say experience. So uh, it's very, very true when, when you're out hunting and, and just learning about it, but really thinking about it. And I think that that's one of the things that I really love about hunting is, um, you know, I've, I've heard the expression that, um, you know, people watch and hunters see because you start to look at those little different things. You really start to see what those ducks and geese are doing or whatever that game you're chasing is. And so I think that, um, yeah, and in and, and those times you fail, you're learning and, and trying again. So um, very similar to ducks, but you got bigger games. So, so bigger bullets, um, shells in this case, but uh, um, you know, geese, I would say they're probably average. I don't know, someone could probably say, but a big Canada goose out of I mean, a, a big a greater Canada goose, I, they joke about 20 pounders. I don't think they get to be 20 pounds, but I think they can get to be 12 and 13 pounds. So you're talking about a pretty big animal that's gonna have um, tough feathers. That's the other thing about geese and uh, uh, selecting a shotgun and shells. Like you can actually hear shot um, bounce off goose feathers. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy how tough that is and how resilient those fibers are. And so um, it's a bigger bird, you're gonna use a bigger shot. Um, once again, I like to, sh I kind of like to overcompensate and, and make sure that you're making a clean kill. Um, certainly you can have some meat loss to that, but like, I'd, I'd rather have a clean ethical kill and, and have that bird in, in the bag than, than wounded. And so, um, I really like to shoot double bees or triple bees at this. Um, you know, uh, one of the other things that this says is hot, heavy shot. There's some blends. Um, you know, it's illegal to shoot lead shot at, um at waterfowl uh, i think that passed in 89 or it's been illegal for a long time to shoot lead shot at waterfowl now there are some effectiveness tied to lead shot it is 
it moves faster, it hits harder and things like that. And so you can't do that. Steel shot, which is the legal way to hunt um, and the right way to hunt tends to not be as dense and not hit as shot uh, hard. So there's some things you can do. There's biz, there's other non-toxic shots that are gonna um, hit a lot more like lead, but they're also real expensive. Um, so, you know, it's always trying to figure that out. I mean, you can spend $40 on a box of bismuth uh, shotgun shells and, and that gets pretty expensive to miss. You know, you're starting to think about a buck 50 every time you miss or, and, uh, and so there's also these blends though. So that's one of the, the cool things. And, and this mentions heavy shot. I really like that. And that's a blend of steel shot and some other denser, non-toxic, more expensive shot. Yeah. And actually heavy shot we use in our program, especially for Turkey, um, heavy shot actually can have steel only, but it'll okay. actually have a series of one to three different shot sizes, which is super effective when you aren't completely understanding the distance of your shot and how far the pattern can travel. And so we actually use it a lot in turkey hunting um, that's effective close range and far range, and they make it for waterfowl also with steel only. And it's actually, just like you said, a little more expensive, but super worth it. Heavy Shot is a very awesome company that has taken into account that you are going to be a shooter, that your first shot might be close range and the second one might be far range or your first one might be far and your second one might be closer. And their pattern has usually about three different shot sizes. So they fall out at different paces within your shot. And it actually really helps you um, with your animal and actually ethically dropping that animal out of the sky. So Heavy Shot is definitely a company to look into and it does very good with different shot variations for different species, not just waterfowl, but also turkey hunting and um, super effective, very expensive, but well worth the money on what you can um, actually satisfactory, good ethical shots um, while you're hunting. Mm -hmm. um, so the last thing is max range. You're gonna hear this term in waterfowl called sky busting. And that essentially refers to people shooting at waterfowl that they have little or no um, chance of, hit, of ethically killing or knocking down. And, and it ruins everyone else's hunting experience. Um, it wounds birds without making kills. It's just a bad thing to do. And so usually when we're talking about shooting waterfowl or anything in, in shotgun range, I mean, there's some, some differences with turkey hunting potentially um, and where you can maybe get outside 40. But even then, I think that that is kind of the gold standard of inside 40 yards. Uh, a quick tip on that. Um, when we're hunting on a big lake, um, where it can be really hard to, or any lake where it can be hard to judge distance. Um, we actually put a, a one decoy that looks different than all the other decoys at 35 yards. And we know everyone in our blind knows that birds inside that decoy are in range to be, um, ki you know, ethically killed. And so, you know, that, that can be a pretty good tip to do. Um, if you have a range finder, you can always uh, shoot some distances and understand that. But um, sometimes when you don't have a backdrop, uh, especially like on, on a lake or a pond, it can be hard to tell how far things are. So if you can give yourself a leg up and and walk a decoy out and say, hey, we're going to shoot them inside that because we know where that is. Um, and, and no one likes a sky buster. So, so you don't want to do that. Um, you know, there, there's places where you can only take um, certain amounts of shells in with you. I don't think we have any of those in Colorado, but um, certainly uh, if you get where there's tons of waterfowl hunting in, in kind of the Mississippi Delta and things like that, a lot of those state wildlife areas will um, dictate you can only have 20 shells on you. So to kind of minimize this and make sure people are taking good shots. So um, try and keep them inside 40 yards. Um, gear, uh, gear for goose hunting is going to be very similar to duck hunting, except you probably don't need waders. Um, you're usually going to be using it uh, um, out in a, in a dry field. And so you, you don't need waders. I do think muck boots can be nice because it can get a little muddy out there. Um, they're usually pretty warm. Um, layers again, you know, it's uh, this combination of, of a lot of activity um, and then no activity and, and all the time it's being pretty cold. So you have this potential to sweat. Um, get overheated and then you have to sit down in the cold again and it can just be this pattern of hot cold so layers are always going to be good um, 
you know, it's generally not always true, but waterfowl hunting um, tends to be better the colder it gets, which is, it can be a challenge in itself. I mean, um, if it gets down to daytime highs of 10 degrees, I, I go duck hunting because I, I have a better idea what they're going to do. Same with goose hunting. Um, usually those birds are going to have to feed more often and have a higher calorie intake to stay warm themselves. And so, um, you know, having warm gear and staying warm out there is huge. A face mask can be really good or face paint. Um, uh, you know, we're all pretty sick of face masks now. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess that, that was the application before COVID would be to goose hunt or be out in the cold. Um, you know, boots are really good. Insulated boots, probably you're probably going to want insulated boots are really good socks when you're um, goose hunting. I, I also think uh, uh, muck boots are great. They usually have some insulation, um, some waterproof and mud proof uh, um, characteristics. Um, heaters are good. I, I keep a blind bag. Um, and I've got a little Mr. Buddy heater that can go a long ways, you know, um, it's not going to make you warm, but there is a big difference of sitting still in, uh, you know, 30 degrees than 10, to, you know, 15 or 20 degrees. And, and so if you can take a little chill off in, in a pit, um, or even in a blind that that's going to help you, um, hand and toe warmers, uh, a good thing always to have, because once you get cold out there, it's hard to get it back. And especially if you don't have some hand warmers, if your hands get really cold, um, sometimes hand and toe warmers can break that chill. Uh, or help you break that chill even once you've layered back up. So, uh, but very similar to uh, duck hunting, just probably don't need the waders because you're probably not gonna be in the water. Um, so a little bit about the last slide here, I think, or nope, we got some, we got some uh, decoy pattern slides. Oh, Kathleen's helping again. I, I was just gonna say, you guys, when in doubt, like, Justin covered it earlier. You can put on your waiting. You can put on your fly fishing waders. You can put on anything that keeps you dry. Um, anything that keeps you warm and you are good to go. And like he talked about movement is a huge deal. If you could stay still, even if you don't have the camo that's around you, you're fine. Like go try it. You will literally learn what flaw you had and where you need to improve. But as long as you're warm, you've got snacks, you've got a warm drink, you're good to go. Like try it, enjoy it, love it. Don't worry about the money involved. I'm still with Justin that it's fun sometimes to get the gear that's specific to it. But literally I've got duck gear that I wear for big game hunting because I need to cross a river and then I need to like potentially cross again so I wear my duck waders other times I'm literally like I don't need my duck waders they're ready for winter so I'm just gonna wear my fishing stuff stay still play it out be sneaky enjoy yourself try it and love it it doesn't take a lot of money it just takes you being happy, warm, and fed, and you're good to go, and a good shotgun. But otherwise, try it, love it, enjoy it, and don't be intimidated. Yeah, just being out, seeing a sunrise over marsh or, you know, that, that's what it's about and, and the experience. And so, you know, but if you're cold, it's hard to enjoy any of that. So, um, you know, definitely want to want to get that up there. So, um, goose decoys, once again, um, Facebook, uh, is a great place to find goose decoys. Outfitters sell them. Um, you know, there's lots of different types. So, um, goose decoys, there's three main types. A silhouette is going to be, um, not paper thin, but they're oftentimes made, um, out of kind of the, the, the signs you see like campaign signs made out of that kind of material. It's kind of that um, uh, cardboard with like kind of a, a plastic coating on it. And they're going to be just a picture of a goose that's a goose size. And you can put out a ton of those. They're going to be cheaper and, and the ge geese will uh, see those and come in. And so that's a silhouette. I'm going a little backwards. Um, probably I'm kind of going backwards because of cost. Those are probably going to be the, the most inexpensive, easiest to um, transport, easiest to set out um, way to get started. Shells are going to be a um, they're hollow. You're going to put them on the ground. Uh, geese oftentimes just kind of um, hunker down on the ground when they're done feeding or, or walking around. And so shells are going to um, just sit flat on the ground. They're not going to have feet like these full bodies that are pictured. Um, and once again, shells are nice. They're going to be 
less expensive. You can stack them on top of each other. So you can put them, uh, you can kind of transport them easier, store them easier. And then, you know, kind of the gold standard for goose decoys is going to be full body, uh, full body goose decoys. So they're going to be, they're going to be most effective. They look the most like real birds. Birds respond to them the best without a doubt, but they're also expensive. Um, back to the, I mean, those decoys we're probably looking at probably stand, I don't know, 16, 18 inches tall. And from their tail to the tip of their head might be 24 inches. So they're pretty bulky. So, you know, um, you can only fit, even in a full side truck, you can only fit a couple dozen decoys in them. So, um, but they are the most realistic looking and probably the most effective. So it's always just trying to match, um, you know, cost and effectiveness and, 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 you know, how you can store it and, and haul it. So, um, yeah, and so th that's how we're gonna, uh, we're looking at goose decoys. The other thing is you can use a combo of those things. Um, you can have silhouettes and shells and a couple of full bodies. That's what a lot of people do. And that's a good way to add some realism. Um, you don't have to have one or the other of those. So, um, yeah. So I accidentally deleted a question trying to answer it, but it had to do with what choke you choose and so I was trying to demonstrate, like, depends on your distance. So a lot of times, just depending on your species, a goose would take a tighter choke than a duck would take. But I will let Justin tackle that answer, but I don't know how to do it on the online because I deleted it. So Justin's up with what kind of choke would you choose depending on your waterfowl you're shooting? Yep. And so chokes, just so we know we're all on the same page, um, shotguns have different patterns and that's how far their sh shot spreads out. Um, and you're going to be able to control how far that shot spreads out by a choke tube. And what that is, is usually an insert on old guns. It was set in the barrel, but on almost all modern guns, it's going to be a screw in piece that goes in the top of your barrel. Um, you know, I think you can and should just about always shoot a modified um, at game. Um, full chokes, oftentimes you don't want to shoot steel from them. Um, I don't think they're always necessary to have a full choke shotgun. There's certainly applications for them. Totally different story if you're talking about turkey hunting, where I would say you absolutely want to have a full choke. Um, but I would say for 90% of waterfowl hunting, um, a modified choke is fine. Um, it's going to give a good pattern. Um, I don't think even with a full choke or um, bigger shot, you should really be shooting outside 40 yards. So um, that would be my advice on choke tubes. And, and I don't think you need to get too granular between ducks or geese. I would control um, the difference in their size through the size of shot you shoot. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I had out about choke tubes. Yeah. And actually commenting on what you talked about full is actually, or um, depending on your full steel is usually not even recommended with a uh, full choke on any shot. Most shotguns that I've come across um, actually don't want steel as their um, as the material for their shot. So excellent point on that. Just double check your shotgun and what you're allowed to shoot depending on what choke you put in. Most shotguns these days come with chokes and usually they'll tell you if they are specific to steel or steel and other materials. So double check that when you see your choke, depending on what shotgun you buy. Yep. And so there's going to be a little tool you can, you know, um, and that's just going to screw out of the top of your shotgun, you know, back to the firearm. You really shouldn't be out hunting if you can't um, load, unload your gun, understand what your choke tubes are and things like that. Like I would say that should happen long before you're in the field, but once you get there, um, I just, I think a modified is good for everything. Um, so, so that's what I shoot at least. Um, so some, we got a couple slides here on decoy spreads. Um, you know, I don't quite feel like it's as easy as this uh, early, late season. I think that how I set decoys and, and I'm not as strict on, on the set patterns. I watch ducks and geese a lot and, and you want to look like ducks and geese. And I know that's like kind of a, a silly thing to say, but um, you know, but you are going to see some pretty traditional ways that geese are going to set themselves up in the field. Usually you're going to have a big group of geese um, feeding. Uh, 
and this is where this X pattern we're talking about, but um, sometimes it can look a little bit more like two little dots or, but you're generally gonna have a group of geese feeding and you're gonna have some satellite groups or sentry groups. I think they're more satellite groups than sentry, but usually with some geese with their heads up and they're gonna be away from the main body of feeding. So um, usually they all land together and then they start to spread out. Um, as a general rule, not always, but as a general rule, waterfowl that are packed in close together are nervous. Um, the more they're spread out within reason of, of still having a spread, um, that is a more relaxed posture for them. That means that they're going about their business, they're focused on feeding, they're not worried about um, something coming into them. Um, but you know, I, I don't think it's as easy as early mid, uh, early and mid season. I think that um, there's different applications. You know, we go from in in example of duck hunting, we go from using very few decoys to when we go and hunt on the 19th after the spread, we might put out 12 dozen decoys, and then by the end, we're going to be back to a couple decoys. Geese are very much like that. You see them some big feeds where there's tons and tons of geese in there. It's going to be hard to hunt those geese anyways, but. Um, you know, so you're usually talking about a group of geese feeding, um, your the mob of your decoys, and then some spread out geese to make it appear like they're a little bit um, posturing in more of a relaxed way and and starting to spread out and go about their business. Um, same thing, wind's always going to be key. Um, geese are going to, for the most part, face into the wind and feed into the wind. And so um, this is a diagram for a coffin blind setup or a, a layout blind set up and so those are the blinds those would be one person individual blinds laying on the ground they've got their decoys around them they've got a landing zone um, right in front where they're encouraging the birds to come and then they've got these kind of uh this is a u-shaped pattern they've got them here but you know in this pattern if you went further out you also might see them um having some little groups up above it upwind of them um those because the geese are always going to land downwind um here they're using a combination of shells and, and full bodies um and you know and that's that's kind of probably more using those shells as a filler to to appear like more geese down feeding so um that's how they're doing that one um if you were flagging you'd be flagging here the other thing that um i think the funnest thing in the world is when you can be sitting in your blind right in front of the landing zone and you can get really close, great shots. You get to see the birds come in and it's really hard to execute. So oftentimes you'd see people move their blinds um, off to the side, which we're going to see on the next one um, on the pit blind. So um, this one, the blinds more here. Um, and I would say that this would apply to uh, those layout blinds too. Um, and you're going to get more side shots at them. You'd have the geese come in. And once again, it's kind of a, a J hook or a U pattern. I don't think you need to be real worried if, if your spread looks more like a J or a U, you're, you're probably fine. Um, but, you know, and, and similar thing here, um, you're going to want to spread out those full body decoys because they're going to look the most realistic. And then you're going to put the shells in to fill in that space and kind of give yourself a bigger footprint so that birds can see you from further away. Um, once again, they're gregarious. So, the you know, not always true, but the more birds on the ground, the more confident they are going to be to come in and land. And so uh, that's that's what we have here on the on the J hook. So, um, yeah. So the next thing we're talking a little bit about places to hunt. Um, so this is a fun one, and, and it's also really uh, you know it can be dangerous um, hunting on ice. So um, birds will also tend to um, rest on ice or roost on ice. And one of the things um, that you also think about with waterfowl is a general rule would be is as long as there's both open water and uncovered crops, there's probably some waterfowl around. The more of that water that turns into ice and the more of that crop that gets covered in snow, the more those birds are gonna head south. They're just gonna get up and leave. So, but that being said, if you can find birds that are using ice, you can have a whole lot of fun and, and hunt them. I would also say as a public land hunter for geese, in my view, your probably best opportunity to, to harvest some geese on a public land on an SWA would be once things freeze up, there's still geese around. Some of the craziness of the beginning of the season is past and you're setting up on the ice um, trying to intercept some geese coming in to roost on that ice. So um, that can be good. And, and there's just a little bit more access than, than ag crops sometimes. You're also going to have the opportunity to hide easier if you're on ice because there's probably some cover around those ponds and lakes. But it can be very dangerous. Um, something 
else is it's not legal in every SWA. One of the SWAs and reservoirs we hunt a whole lot. Um, it is illegal to hunt from the frozen surface of the ice. Um, so you'll definitely want to check those individual SWA regulations because because they can vary. Um, so uh, you know, taking ropes, any safety equipment you can have. Um, you know, they make um like handles that like basically picks that you can use to self rescue and ice those aren't a bad thing to have if you're ice fishing or, or hunting on ice um you know using shells i think shells or full bodies are fine on the ice um similar patterns to ducks absolutely um you know having a ma uh, kind of a big group in the middle and then and having some satellite groups or or shaping that group so it looks like those geese have started to spread out is a good thing. Um, it is also a great place to hunt shells. It's actually the place you're probably going to see real geese look like shell decoys. The most is you will see geese feet tucked up under their body sitting on the ice. And so um, shells can look really good there. Um, I've shot ducks on ice, you know, on the ice too. They'll come in and, and hang out and loaf on the ice too. Um, similar patterns and decoy spreads to ice. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, trees on the shoreline that's a good point you know that that's a that's a fine line to walk you got to be able to hide but as things get later in the season um those water that waterfowl is going to be less likely to be up on the shores and close where they've been shot at you know and and so you're you're always going to try and strike that balance of where can i hide and, and where can i get the the ducks or geese to come in um all right so uh the next slide is where to go so I really thought about this and if, if I was a new hunter and I wanted to do it, a, a DIY duck hunt on myself, my own, I would go in early October on a pond that I'd seen ducks on forest service property. A lot of reasons I say that is it's just not going to have the pressure. Um, and I think you're not going to get a ton of ducks, but you'll probably get some ducks. There's going to be a huge variance in what kind of ducks you can get. And so if you just ask me, Hey, I'm a new hunter. And I think you can do it with very few decoys. I think on some of those like ponds and things like that, those mountain ponds or in the foothills and things like with six or eight decoys, you could have a reasonable chance of going out and getting some ducks. Um, you get out on the places where there's more ducks, there's more hunters, there's more access, and that can be a bigger challenge. That being said, there is awesome state property. Um, Tamarack out east is one of the best managed SWAs I've seen. You get reservations, so you're not setting up on top of each other they're really easy to get you can even do walk-in reservations most mornings um i got i think they got about eight i mean maybe a, maybe eight or nine miles straight of river bottom there that you can check out and hunt um there's some water projects out there that they start pumping in right now during the split we're on the split right now and they're going to start bringing in and creating some warm water sloughs that's habitat for them so and that's a that's a resource you own that's public land that's owned by the state and managed by the state and it's really a really well done um opportunity um you know you get out east i don't know the western part of the state for waterfowling near as much as i do big game so i can't speak to that but you know swa is where it's allowed they're, they're created for your access and for your you know to have opportunity to go do these things and so they're, they're great places to go um there's been a big push and i'm really proud to be part of bha with open up some of the state trust lands um and they've opened up a ton of of, uh, of new acres there and, and there's some waterfowl opportunities in there um and then private property hey i mean it is a, it is just a little easier to, to be successful water while hunting on private property I, i've never passed up a, an opportunity to go hunt a private slough for ducks um and i don't get those opportunities very often i don't have a lease um i do 99 percent of my hunting on public land and, and feel like we do pretty successful um and then, but an outfitter, if you just wanted to try this one time and you did have some, a, a little bit of money to spend, you want to learn a lot, see if you liked it, um, that'd be a great way to go. Um, the other thing I would give you uh, some hints on hunting public land. Um, first of all, you don't, certainly the best duck hunting is that first hour, generally, right? But that doesn't mean that's always the best hunting. Um, at, there's an SWA that we know of out east, and I get real cagey about the specifics of it, so I'm not going to say it, but we know it has a warm water slough on it, and I have on multiple occasions when it was snowy, um, watched someone pack up at 9 a.m. without any ducks and gone out, and one day we shot 20 Drake Mallards, four, a four-person limit between 10 and 1. We knew that the duck pattern changes in the snow and they were out feeding in the corn during the day and they were coming back to the water in the middle of the day, a time you didn't think. So, 
you know, I, I guess, you know, thinking about when you're hunting about public land, thinking about how you can either look a little different than the people next to you um, or hunt at a little different time um, can also be a really good strategy to find some places to go. Um, and also the reservation system. I, I, I don't know what that looks like on the Western slope, but there's a ton of SWAs um, that have, you know, reservations either same day or you can, you can book them, I think up to two weeks in advance. Um, and those are great. You don't have someone coming up and setting up on top of you um, or right next to you that either runs, ruins your hunt or quite frankly, I've been in some situations where I was like, we're not staying here because this doesn't feel safe. And, and you know, and always, if, if you're in a situation like that, I, I would also say you can call CPW. I mean, that is a, a, but that's a thing. And so some of those reservations and just doing a little research in um, online, you know, that, that um, CPW uh, Atlas is amazing. It's a great tool. There's layers and there's information and you can really just dive into there and get, get a ton of information there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how I'd think about places to go. Perfect. I'll add to that. The reservation system is statewide. Um, we actually have some partners within the front range usually that offer up as an easement, um, opportunities for waterfowl hunting also. So we do have areas that are available for you to sign up so you can get um, blinds set up for yourself so you can slide in without worrying about other people that are going to be there. Um, if you can get on or want to pay for um, some of the permission to be on a private land opportunity by easements for the fall, so that's your area for the fall, um, definitely different opportunities. But at any point, if you ever feel unsafe or you feel like someone in a neighboring blind isn't following rules, things like that, that's that, that's that relationship that you should have with your DWM or park ranger. And so you feel comfortable talking to them about something that's going on that makes you feel uncomfortable. You should always feel comfortable on our state properties. Um, hopefully you yourself and others are always paying attention to safety as a priority, but always remember you can call us, you can talk to us and um, talk to the local area and make sure that you stay safe and feel comfortable. Um, we do have lots of things on our website that talk about our state wildlife areas, state land trust and different opportunities. And then as Justin spoke of, there is private property that you can actually lease for the fall so that's yours for hunting purposes so there's lots of different opportunities but definitely lots of public opportunities out there and available and we do have within our brochure starting on page 17 um, we have lots of different land use rules specific to different state wildlife areas. Um, Justin kind of mentioned to it, but he's got some honey holes that he loves to go to that you don't kind of mention to other people. But you'll find those areas that you feel really comfortable and lots of birds come in and that you can hunt. And if not, you just look at our state land opportunities, give them a try, and then you'll find that you like certain areas and you other areas are a little more too public, but um, they are there. And then there are opportunities that you can sign up and have blinds that are specific to you that no one else can ruin your opportunity to hunt. So those are available. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, and there there really are a lot of great opportunities. And I think sometimes there there is a perception that you can't effectively hunt you know waterfowl on public land in Colorado and I just it's just not true I think that uh there's just really great opportunities all over the state to do it and and it's really well managed and well run and and they're continuing to add new properties and new opportunity and, and that's awesome and you know and, and that's a big a really fun thing to do too is go out and walk around some of those state wildlife areas and get to know them and you one might have a duck pond at the back of it full of ducks that you never knew about and you didn't know until you you went and, and saw it so um definitely a lot of opportunities this you know this is uh the swas i was talking about that a little bit there are a bunch of them there's you know the that um cpw atlas is an awesome tool to to find those um and you know and then those local field office the people at Br in the brush office i talk to them they, they're probably sick of hearing about from me sometimes i'm like hey what, what are you hearing what are you seeing uh but getting to know that uh and uh yeah and, and building those relationships are great i i've got to get to know uh um the the new wildlife ranger out in uh 
the far northeastern part of the state because um one of the guy we used to always talk to he retired three years ago but he would even call we got to know him so well he would give me a call and say hey the mallards are here buddy and so uh that that's a pretty pretty good ally to have in terms of, of tracking tracking where the waterfowl is moving yeah so to hunting reservations on certain properties can be made through our um 1-800 number or online <coughs> sorry my allergies have kicked in um, but that is on page 17 of our regulations manual. So you can totally look at that and see what areas of it across our state are available for duck and goose hunting. Some of them are private, some of them are state wildlife areas, but all are available for the hope that you can get out there and have an awesome opportunity. So thank you, Justin, for your adding into the um, 101 tonight. Um, obviously, our questions and answers are still available if anybody's still with us. Um, excellent resources. Obviously, anything online has potential of being excellent, but our website actually has some really good waterfowl decoy basics and videos that you can tune into. But before we um, say goodbye, I really want you guys to talk to like to learn from Justin and Elena and Jamie. And um, Kristen, Kristen's based more out of our Steamboat area, but, um, and I'm based out of Grand Junction. I can totally help people out with hunter outreach and getting into hunting um, and the skills of it all. But I um, honestly rely on these guys who have helped us out through the seminar to do the specifics of Waterfowl 101. Cause literally, like I said, if I'm gonna call a duck, there might as well be a coyote coming into the area. So I would love for you guys to hear from Justin and Elena and um, Jamie and Kristen about opportunities. Kristen is based out of Steamboat, like I said. Um, the other groups have online stuff set up so that if you are interested in trying and dabbling in any of the stuff we've talked about, they have opportunities. And it they are great nonprofits to be a part of. So I'm going to leave it to Justin, Elena, um, Jamie, and Kristen to mention anything you need to mention. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and give Justin a break from talking. I just want to start off by saying thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, waterfowl hunting is very overwhelming, just starting from rules and regs. So this is something I've been thinking about for a very long time. And we actually made it happen, which is awesome. Um, and I just want to say Mama. huge thank you. Oh, here comes Ellie. She wants to come say thank you too. <laughs> Future Rocky Mountain sportswoman right here. Um, but yeah, and I can let Jamie tune in too if she wants to. But um, we also, originally with this clinic, we wanted to have like a shotgun day and um, a couple days out in the field together with some ladies. But the fact that we were able to, had to do it virtually, um, but we are able to reach out to more people. So somebody asked, when's 201? I mean, I don't know, Kathleen, <laughs> but uh, I would say 201 is getting out and shooting. Um, I know that's my next step is spending some time practicing with my gun and and then spending some time scouting. You know, I think that's, that would be my next step. That would be my 201. But um, Jamie, you wanna talk a little bit about what we got coming up? and what we do. Yeah, so we have oh. <laughs> Kathleen, the question a bit. <laughs> um, hold on, let me see if I can unmute her. I don't think she realized she's muted. I don't think I can do it. So I'll just, we'll, we'll slide her down in a minute. Um, but I'll just, I'll just go on about our events. So, um, if you go to recommendsportsman.com and you go to the events page, um, you can see what upcoming events that we have. Um, you can also sign up for an email list so you're notified of any upcoming events. Oh, yeah, is Kathleen on mute now? I think she might be good. So you can be notified of any upcoming events. We do have a snowshoe hike coming up as well as a fly fishing clinic. Um, so go ahead and check those out. We do hopefully eventually like get an infield duck clinic. Um, so yeah, check us out, send us a message if you have any questions, if you have any ideas for us, things that you want to learn. We want to know what you want to learn. So um, we're all about it. 
send us a message, sign up for the email list, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys out there. Just <laughs> being muted again. She's just gonna keep going all muted. Whatever, uh, I'm here. Am I here? We can hear her now. How Yay. exciting! Okay, so I was just gonna say I love our partners. I love everything we have going in Steamo. We tried to really make a drive starting in January of this year, and COVID has really shut us down. But with Hunter Outreach, we are available online. Um, we promote you signing in for the actual draw, which is due in April, early April every year. And then we open up our website. We offer turkey. We offer big game hunting to anyone who is interested in learning. But also during the summer, we travel throughout the Northwest region. Um, and we offer clinics that teach shotgun, archery, and um fly fishing classes. And so we've worked really hard with Rocky Mountain um, sports women to try to get stuff going. And every time we've tried, COVID has shut us down. But in hopes we'll be back, any of those skills you're looking to obtain, myself, Brian, and um, the Northwest or the statewide hunter outreach coordinators, are there to teach those kind of things, but we definitely rely on partners to make things happen. And hopefully you guys can sign in um, without Hunter Ed, we'll teach you how to shotgun shoot, to do archery and fly fishing, but then to actually do the hunting kind of thing. We do ask that you get Hunter Ed and we partner with um, lots of different groups and make things happen during the fall. So that's available online and on our website. But I also encourage you to remember to um, keep an open relationship with our officers and with our state parks who have waterfowl opportunities for you to learn to what um, places you can go, um, the blinds you can get. And then within these agencies or um, nonprofit groups that have helped us tonight, they have equipment, they have enthusiasm, they have groups that would love to go hunting with you. So make sure you reach out, make sure you join their pages and um, they're there to totally get you out there into the field and love it. So that's, that's what I was saying when I was muted. <laughs> so I'm not muted anymore. Excellent. We will, uh, we will also, we've been recording this this evening. So if you missed parts, you want to go back to it, all of those things, we're going to make the, the recording available. If you have friends and you say, hey, you should check this out. Uh, we're going to make uh, some of those available as well. So um, I think that's everything. I, I, you, you did get a question there. Looks like Kathleen's got something else to add to, but uh, just a, a note from Laura. She sent in, not really a question, but she just wanted to say, Thanks to you, Kathleen, for helping with her uh, deer hunt education. Um, so everything's good there. And uh, Kathleen, go ahead with anything else you want to add, and then we'll we'll call it an evening. All I wanted to make sure was that um, Kirsten had an opportunity to talk about waterfowl opportunities at the actual state park. So she is steamboat based. And then with Jamie and Elena mention again about who they are and um, what opportunities they have and the blog based site they have. And with Justin to mention his group again and what opportunities and how you can get involved with these guys. So I just wanted to give everybody who helped us tonight through the 101 a chance to mention who they are and how to network because I think it's pretty awesome. Everybody's totally there and ready to get out there and have everybody have a wonderful opportunity with hunting and fishing. And so I just wanted everybody to have another opportunity to say who you are and welcome them to your space. Excellent. So let's start with Kirsten. Kirsten, uh, Steamboat Lake State Park. You also have Pearl Lake. Tell us about uh, opportunities that are available for waterfowl hunting up there. So we do allow waterfowl hunting and actually any type of hunting on the southern portion of Steamboat Lake. There is a big map um, right at the front of our visitor center as you're entering the glass doors. It's on the left and it shows all the huntable areas. The big thing is to be sure that you're um, at least 
a uh, hundred yards from any trail or parking lot building any of our facilities within those areas um it was great this season we had a lot of guys take a lot of birds um it does slow down pretty quickly and those birds wise up and they go over to the swim beach where you can't hunt them um but beginning of the season it's an awesome place to go um pretty easy access really easy walking i mean you can walk further if you'd like but if you want something quick short um simple it's a good first opportunity um we also have a lot of uh i guess they're they're partners of the park concessionaires that um also do guided hunts there and if anybody wants more information um just let me know i'd be happy to put you guys in contact with them they're an awesome group of guys um and another thing that i was going to mention we uh when we opened this up we wanted to make sure people knew they didn't need a hunter education um certificate in order to attend this little webinar that we're doing but i wanted to let everybody know that hunter ed is all online right now unless um it's for youth that are under uh, 11 years old but anybody that is looking for hunter education it's all online um but certainly if people would like to get out in the field and do the live fire portion i know i am a hunter ed instructor and i have been getting out with folks that reach out to me so i'm always happy to go out into the field and we'll obviously maintain our social distance and all of the COVID rules, but um, more people we get in the field, the better. So thanks everybody for your time. Excellent, thank you, Kirsten. So real quick, Jamie or Elena, jump in, tell us where people can find out more information about Rocky Mountain Sportswomen. Go ahead, Jamie. You want me to? Okay, I'll do it. So, <laughs> you can find a lot of information about our Commons Sports Women if you go to www.commonsportswomen.com. Also, follow us on Instagram, same thing, just Rock Commons Sports Women. On Instagram, like I said earlier, um, you, can, you can sign up for our email list and be notified of upcoming events. We do do a lot of different things. Um, we do a lot of We've done a fly tying, um, fly fishing, ice fishing. Um, we've done a fly, fly fishing trip. Um, we're doing like, ice fishing coming up. We have a snowshoe hike. Uh, we have lots of different things going on, um, and we're always uh, having new events as well. A lot of us shoot archery, so we kind of hang out and shoot bows together. Um, we're all about just getting out there together and building a, a networking community of women that want to get out and learn um you don't have to have any experience um everybody is welcome so please come join us um just a really fun group of girls um yeah i hope to see a lot of you out there yeah i just want to tap into that too we we are based out of steamboat but we also have been getting a lot of interest throughout the state um and so we're hoping to start expanding into other areas and um, get some other chapters going within the next year or so. Um, it's been it's been a very uh, grueling process, but it's been amazing. We, we put a lot of work and tears into this process, but Jamie and I have a blast running it and um, love meeting people like you guys and Kathleen and Kirsten have been a huge help in our process too. Um, Kirsten helped us with the ice fishing clinic last year and she's helping us again this year. And uh, we hope for more things like this. I think this is really cool. And hopefully we can get this going again for turkey season. So thanks for everyone tuning in and checking us out. So. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, Jamie. RockyMountainSportsWomen.com is their website. Now let's uh, give this back to Justin for a minute. Justin, backcountry hunters and anglers, if people are interested in finding out more about what you guys do, where, where should they go? Yeah, so there's the website, backcountryhunters.org. You know, we're a public lands and wildlife advocacy group. Um, we really focused on public lands. I think there's a lot of, uh, we kind of joke critter clubs out there that focus on one animal, uh, ducks or turkeys and things like that. And we really try and focus on, you know, the public land experience and, and that whole habitat and partner with all those other organizations. Um, fast growing, really great group. We do recruit, retain, reactivation, um, we do hunting for sustainability, which really has a big uh, piece of the of wild foods. Um, we're doing gathering seminars, so just a really fun group. We have about three thousand members, and um, in just in Colorado, so 
Uh, actually, probably quite a bit more than that. I think that was at the end of last year. But so a lot of members in Colorado and a lot of chapters. So um, guaranteed to be a chapter and a point of contact in every part of the state. Um, you can sign up here, uh, $35 a year. That gives you the publication and full access to the portal, which we post all of our events and you'd be able to get in touch with your, um, your, your chapter leader um, in, in your area. And, and, you know, and even, you know, COVID has been tough for everyone. We haven't been able to do a lot of things we usually do. And yet um, it's one of those things that's outside. So if you can reach out to them, they'll point you in the right direction or, you know, a mentored hunt, if people are comfortable with that, we can socially distance. And it's just a really great group of people that, that want to get new people out in the outdoors and, and kind of talk about public lands and, and advocate for them. And, and, you know, and, and we just really appreciate CPW and the state wildlife agencies and our federal land managers. Um, you know, we just all realize, I think it's a lot about realizing just how lucky and, and how rich we all are in, in terms of, of having that, that public lands piece here. All right, Justin, thank you very much. Once again, can if- I just, uh, Can I just yeah. tap one? Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I'm also a, a leadership team member for the Colorado BHA chapter. And um, BHA is kind of what got me started in, in, with Rocky Mountain Sportsman. They inspired me to do what we're doing now. Um, <laughs> sorry, she's a wild child. Um, but we, uh, I hope to do more partnerships with BHA in the future and and, huge shout out to Brian Webster for putting me in contact with Justin and uh Justin thank you so much for your enthusiasm to help us with this um, yeah absolutely it was great it was perfect so fun awesome excellent it's good to see the next generation already working there Elena so you got your helper that's awesome so if anybody has other questions they want to talk to talk to us about any of this this evening check out our website cpw.state.co.us um, and if anybody has questions or follow up or, or needs to get in touch with anybody on this, this webinar this evening, um, you can always send an e email to me. I'll make sure it gets to the right people. My email address is fairly simple. It's randy.hampton, H-A-M-P-T-O-N, at state.co.us. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen, for putting everything together and for all of our presenters this evening. Just want to say thank you to, to all of you and, and thanks for everybody for participating.